He's undeniably one of the greatest intellectual phenomenons of our generation. Dr. Jordan Peterson's work as a clinical psychology professor at the University of Toronto has catapulted him to international fame with arguments that are challenging and changing the way we all think. He has captured the attention of millions, especially of young men, but some young women as well. And many of you, however, have never heard of him, but you will get to know him for the first time through this interview. Today he is here, breaking down his provocative rules for life and the prescription for success that will surprise many of you. Thank you for joining us. Thanks for the invitation. So it is uh, an interesting group of, in, of insights that you offer us, and I can enter it in many ways, but let me just start with, for me, the, perhaps the most obvious, which is what is it that you're saying that's resonating with so many people? What's, what itch are you scratching? I think there's probably two. We've had a long conversation in our culture about the necessity for self-esteem and happiness, and that's not what I'm talking about. I tell my audiences and my readers very straightforwardly that life is difficult and that there's a lot of suffering in it, and that you have to learn how to conduct yourself in the face of that. The problem with the pursuit of happiness is that when life's storms come along, happiness disappears, and then you're left with nothing. And so you need to pursue something that's deeper than happiness. And if happiness comes along, well then, hooray for you. You don't want to despise it because it's fleeting, but it's much better to pursue things that are meaningful than things that make you happy. It's deeper and, and it orients you more appropriately and it, and it keeps you centered in your own life and makes you more useful for your family and your community. So that's one thing. And it's a relief to young people to know that the baseline conditions of life are difficult but that you can still prevail. So it's a funny message in some sense, or a strange message, because on the one hand, it's somewhat pessimistic. Mm -hmm. Now I talk about suffering and malevolence also, but I also emphasize the fact that despite, despite that being the base conditions of existence, people are tough enough to prevail. So that's, that's one element of it. The other element is the, the, the necessity of responsibility. So a lot of what people find in life that provides them with a sustaining meaning is a consequence of not the pursuit of rights or the pursuit of happiness or, or, the, or, the, or the development of self-esteem, but the adoption of responsibility. And the more responsibility, in some sense, the better. Responsibility for yourself, for making sure that your life lays itself out like it should, responsibility for your family, responsibility for the community. It's people who take responsibility that are the ones that you admire, and that's the right pathway through life. That's where meaning is to be found. And I think that's probably the crucial issue, is that ide identification of a profound relationship between responsibility and meaning. And for many of the people that I'm talking with, it seems like that's the first time that that's been articulated for them. So speaking about responsibility and meaning and, and how to make sense of a world where so many people feel isolated, mm -hmm. I'll come back to that. That seems so helpful. And yet, You've been a, a lightning rod in many ways with a lot of harsh comments, especially in the print media. Mm -hmm. What is it that your critics are arguing? Well, I got embroiled in some political dispute, I would say, on my home front in Canada when our government introduced some legislation that purported to be about compassion, which, but which to my way of thinking was about compulsion with regards to speech. And so that's tangled me up. But I also think that people aren't necessarily that happy with a message of personal responsibility when they're really interested in the mechanics of social change. You know, my sense is, is that, well, life is unfair. Social structures are unfair. Uh, the arbitrary way that illness is distributed into the population is unfair. But despite that, the best level of analysis for rectifying that in, in, in a practical sense, but also in the psychological sense, is the level of the individual. And so people who think in a collectivist manner or people who, who are playing identity politics games that insist that your group identity should be your hallmark don't like what I have to say at all. And, and they have their reasons. I'm, I'm not a fan of identity politics types. I think it's a very, very dangerous game, particularly because it makes us tribal. And tribal people are very dangerous, you know, as as we degenerate into our tribal groups, the probability of, of violence increases as far as I'm concerned. That's what the anthropological data would suggest as well. So 
the collectivist types don't like me very much. You're, you're, you're clinical psychology, mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it's a challenging profession. You chose it uh, coming out of a rural town in central Canada. Mm -hmm. How did that advance your life journey? What, what, is, what in your life has inspired you to do what you do now? And especially to take some of the public steps now that are drawing criticism to you, which is always painful. Well, I've always been obsessed with totalitarianism and authoritarian governments, whether they're on the right or the left. I mean, for years, decades really, I spent almost all of my free time thinking about what happened in Nazi Germany and in Russia in, in, in the, during the Soviet era, but also in Maoist China. There were other places as well. Trying to understand how it was that we could have got off the rails so absolutely terribly. Mm -hmm. And I started studying that at the collectivist level, I would say, looking for political reasons or economic reasons. But as I investigated further, those levels of analysis became increasingly, um, they, weren't, they weren't providing the answers that I wanted. I think partly because I was really interested in the notion that there's something to learn from what happened, say, in Nazi Germany. But there's something to learn at an individual level. That's my estimation. I don't think that there were innocent masses of people led astray by a single malevolent leader. I don't think the fundamental motivations for what happened in Nazi Germany were economic. And I, I don't think they were in the Soviet Union either. As I read more and more about the situations, I realized that the proclivity of individuals to avoid responsibility and to lie, especially about their own lives and about their own experience, were really the reasons that those systems went so far astray. Now, there were other reasons as well, but those were very important to me because I also thought that the proper lesson in the aftermath of something like Auschwitz is how do I ensure that I live a life such that if I was offered the opportunity to do something terrible by omission or by commission that I wouldn't do it that I would have enough strength of character to resist. And so the lessons there for me were psychological. And that taught me an awful lot about, well, the role of the individual. People like Viktor Frankl, for example, who wrote Man's Search for Meaning, which is a perennial classic and a great book, insisted that a large part of the reason that Germany went off the rails so badly was because individual Germans were so willing to falsify their own experience. And Alexander Solzhenitsyn, who wrote the Gulag Archipelago, the best document on what happened in the Soviet Union, also made exactly the same argument. So I got interested in the psychological, psychological causes of, of catastrophic governance, let's say. And that taught me a lot. It taught me about responsibility, about the responsibility of the sovereign individual. Mm -hmm. And you know, we have an idea in our culture, it's a very powerful idea, that each of us is of intrinsic value, but that associated with that value is a, a responsibility. And we have a responsibility, let's say, for, the, for our own integrity and for that of our families, but also of the state, because otherwise we wouldn't have the sovereign responsibility and right to vote. Like our whole culture is predicated on the idea that each of us are sufficiently significant so that we can entrust the destiny of the state itself to our decisions. It's like, well, I believe that, and I, I think that that's a correct idea, which is also why I think that systems that are based on that idea function so well, like our Western systems do. Mm -hmm. But that's a responsibility that has to be taken with dead seriousness because it means that the good things that you do in your life are truly good and they matter. They ripple outward way more than you think, but so do the things you do that aren't good, including the acts of deception that you engage in, perhaps above all else, which would include your willingness to evade responsibility or to push it off to someone else or, or to, to, to play the short term against the long term. But, and so, so well. Let me, let me unwrap this a little bit because you're touching on, on a bunch of themes and I think they, they, they would all benefit us. So first of all, let me say, you, I appreciate that you actually put some of your thoughts down into two books, two books that I've read. The, the latter is a you know, best-selling book right now. It's like number four selling book in the country, uh, 12 Rules for Life, Antidote to Chaos. And I am curious how you put that all together. And let's start off with the basic, which is what's it all about? What's the goal of life? According to the, some of the more recent pieces you've been writing. I would say that the goal in life is to conduct yourself so that life improves. At least so that undue suffering is forestalled. But more than that, so, so that, that's, it's to constrain malevolence and suffering to the degree that that's possible. But then also to work for a positive improvement in things at every level. 
And that's, that's how you should orient yourself. So I saw something you wrote, um, actually it's, it's, in, it's in the book in, in part as well, is to repeat actions that are worthy. Mm -hmm. Yes, which noble is sort of, and worthy. That would noble be and worthy, yes, mm -hmm. right? So you sort of figure out what you should do and then just do it, mm -hmm. which I think that's mm -hmm. an achievable goal. Most people would think that's laudatory. Mm -hmm. That takes me to the next point, which is what's the meaning of life? And I think the meaning is to be found in that. And, and as, you, as you put things together, and as you take responsibility for things, the meaning emerges from that. And so it emerges from that the same way it emerges from a symphony, in some sense, you know, because a symphony is composed of layers of patterns and they're all working harmoniously together. And they speak directly to people of meaning, which is why people love music so much. I mean, every form of music does that. And it's a model for proper being, which is the, the, the placing of all the different levels of reality into harmonious relationship with one another. And meaning emerges out of that naturally. And meaning is actually an instinct. This is another thing that people don't understand, and it's a case I've been able to make because I, I, I know a fair bit about how the brain works. Your, the two, the twin hemispheres of your brain interact to guide you through life, well, which is a truism yeah. in some sense. You use your brain to guide you through <laughs> life, but your brain does that fundamentally by instilling the, the proper things that you do with a sense of meaning. And that meaning is, it's not something that's just a surface it's not on the surface of the world in some sense. It's the deepest instinct that you have. It's associated with a phenomenon that Russian neuropsychologists discovered back in the 1960s called the orienting reflex. And the orienting reflex is what orients you towards things of interest. Right. And that happens unconsciously. And so if something happens around you that's of significance, often something you don't expect, say something somewhat chaotic, you'll orient towards it and that attracts your attention. And then as you investigate what that is, that's associated with the sense of meaning. And if you put what you're investigating into proper order, then that meaning continues to reveal itself. So you can use meaning as a guide to proper being, but you have to also be very careful to conduct yourself honestly if you're going to do that, because if you conduct yourself dishonestly, then you pathologize the mechanisms that orient you. So it I, I'm thinking about in my own life how I've tried to apply some of these insights. If I just try to be a little bit better today than I was yesterday, mm -hmm. along the lines that you're speaking to, mm -hmm. try to create that symphony, but yeah. be a little better at it today yeah. than yesterday. And like everybody watching right now, not compare myself to somebody else, yeah. but rather to compare myself to the future version of me. Yeah. Is, is that a rational That's a way? Rule. That's rule four, right? That's rule four. Compare yourself to who you were yesterday, not to who someone else is today. Yeah. Well, it's, it's not only appropriate, but I think it's also practical. And one of the things about what I do, including my book, is that I'm always trying to take high-level abstract truths, you know, fundamental truths, and to make them concrete and practical so that you can implement them in your day-to-day -day life. Mm -hmm. Because the, it's the connection between those abstractions and practical action that really cements their meaning and makes them comprehensible. Mm -hmm. And this idea of incremental improvement is a great one. You know, if there are things about your life that are bothering you, or things about the world that are bothering you, then you want to decompose them into solvable sub-problems. And you do this, if you have a child, this is the sort of thing that you do naturally, right? Because you want to set your child a challenge that's sufficiently challenging to push them forward in their development. So that makes it meaningful for the child. That puts them in the zone of proximal development, which is where, where proper maturation takes place. They'll find that intrinsically meaningful. You want to make it challenging, but also with a reasonable probability of success. And, that, and there's an art to that. So you want to set yourself a task that's difficult, but not so difficult you can't attain it. Mm -hmm. And then what happens is that you step up improvement across time, incrementally. And there's also a certain element of humility to it, right? Which is, don't bite off more than you can chew, right? Don't set grandiose goals, but incremental improvement will get you a tremendous distance. When you don't do that perfectly, and it's not easy to do, mm -hmm. you suffer. Mm -hmm. And I've on this stage often said that you know, pain is inevitable. You're gonna mm -hmm. have pain. Uh, how much suffering comes in that pain, you actually have a fair amount of control over. Mm -hmm. Can't make it go away, to your point. It's part of life. Your thoughts around suffering that you, you began to touch on have been incredibly provocative for a lot of people, wildly debated. I think in part because in our modern world, we don't like to acknowledge that kind of suffering can afflict us. Mm -hmm. We think something's wrong with us if we have that kind of suffering. So how is it mm -hmm. productive to focus on suffering the way you do? Well, there is something wrong with us if we're suffering, and there's something wrong with the world, because it, it's an indication that things aren't set in the order they hypothetically could be set if there's undue suffering. And so that is a call to action, and it's a painful call to action. 
you know, but it's, it's a universal problem. Suffering is built into the structure of existence in some sense, and the fact that you're suffering doesn't mean that there's something isolated about you that's at fault, right? Which is, which is an important, this is why the doctrine of original sin was actually quite useful, because everyone makes mistakes and everyone falls short of the glory of God, Speak let's say. Speak to original sin, if you don't mind. Mm -hmm. And this is, uh, this is, again, all the monotheistic religions share this, but it exists in other traditions as well. Mm -hmm. Well, it's, an, it's, an, it's, an, it's a way of universalizing everyone's felt sense that they don't live up to their responsibility properly, because you're not all you could be. And unless you understand that that's, that's everyone's problem, every single person has that issue, then it's easy to become discouraged and crushed by that. And the, the, the major advantage, I think, to, to, to making a case very strongly that one of the fundamental realities of life is its suffering is that it's actually a relief to people to hear that because they suspect it while well, they know it. But no one's forthright about it. It's like, yeah, life is suffering. Okay, fine. So where does that leave us? Well, here's where it leaves us. It turns out that even though life is suffering, if you're sufficiently um, courageous and forthright and honest, let's say, in your approach, and you don't shy away, yeah. what you'll find is that there's something within you that will respond to the challenge of suffering with the development of ability that will transcend the suffering. So the pessimism is, yeah, well, Life is rife with problems every, at every level. But the upside is, if you turn and confront that voluntarily, that you'll find something in yourself that can develop and master that. And so the, the, the optimism is nested in the pessimism. And that's extremely helpful to people, especially people who are struggling because they think, oh my God, life is so difficult. I don't know if I can stand this. There must be something wrong with me. Does anybody else feel this way? And you can say, yes, everyone feels that way at some time. But that's, and, and, and it is as bad as you think, but you're more than you think you are. You're more than you think you are. And what I really like about this too is it's very much in keeping with the clinical data. So for example, what you do as a clinician, as a clinical psychologist, as a psychiatrist, um, as any mental health professional who's well-trained is if, if people are afraid of something, afraid of something that's standing in their way as an obstacle, like maybe you're trying to develop your career and you're afraid of public speaking. Mm -hmm. Well, I could try to calm you down about your fear and, and protect you from the challenge that would be associated with public speaking and say, well, you never have to do that. Or I could say, no, no, look, you have to learn to present yourself more effectively in public if you're going to develop your career and you're afraid of it. So let's break down what you're afraid of in, into 10 steps or 20 steps until we can find a step that's small enough so that you can actually master it. And let's assume that with three years of diligent practice that you could become a competent public speaker, at least one that isn't terrified. And with five years, you could become an expert. And let's decide how relevant that is to your future prosperity and thriving. And then let's assume that if you break it down properly and take it on step by step in this incremental way that we discussed, mm -hmm. that you'll actually master every single bit of it. And the thing that's cool about that is all the clinical evidence shows it works. And not only that, that's actually how you learn in life. Like when, you're, when, you're, when you bring a child to the playground and the child is apprehensive about making new friends, you say, okay, well, look, kiddo, stick around me for a minute or two and just watch what's going on. It's like, and the child will calm down and say, okay, no, go five feet away. Just yeah. go out there a little bit and just see how it goes and stay out there as long as you can. And if you need to come back for a hug, then no problem. It's like, so then the child can go out 10 feet and they come back and say, okay, well now, you know, maybe just go over there and, and, and watch those kids and the child will go out and then come back. And so that's it. It's their, the child's going out to where they're afraid, seeing that they can master it and then coming <clears throat> back. So this so, seems so self-evident that I'm, I'm left wondering, well, did people know this 100 years ago? This issue of taking responsibility, which I think is part of the, the, the pain that people feel, because it, it, it's not something we expect a lot. Mm -hmm. and people don't realize that it seems to help a lot in most scenarios mm -hmm. if you sort of own it, because you control mm -hmm. your destiny. Mm -hmm. So do we, there's this wisdom we hadn't forgotten. You spoke about original sin. These are stories that are thousands of years old, Adam and Eve, right? Mm -hmm. right? These are constructs that are archetypal to us, are fundamental to who our species is, and somehow it s seems to have slipped from us. Well, some, you know, knowledge is coded in different ways, eh? Mm -hmm. So a good example, someone who's a good example acts out for you how you should be. And a good story portrays that dramatically. 
but an articulated representation tells you exactly why and explains it. And so some of this needs to be more articulated than it has been because we've become detached in some sense from our underlying examples and our stories, mm -hmm. partly because they've been criticized so much. So, but I think we're at a point where developing this more articulated knowledge is necessary. But just so I make sure everyone's clear on this, what I'm taking away is it's a balancing act between the rights you deserve and the responsibility that you must take. Mm -hmm. And if that balances off in society, and we do seem to focus yeah. a lot on people's rights, yeah. which is you know, instinctive to who we are, yeah. but we often don't pa 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 match it up with the responsibility right. that well, comes which, along well, with Which that. is exactly why I think that what I'm talking about is falling on <clears throat> receptive ears, is because you actually cannot have a prolonged discussion of rights without having an equally prolonged discussion of responsibilities for a variety of reasons. First of all, the actual reason that you have rights is so that you can discharge your responsibilities. It's not the other way around. It's like you're granted rights by everyone around you, or, or no, it's not granted exactly. It's part of the, part of the, the purpose of your rights in some sense mm -hmm. is so that you can be given an autonomous space that's protected, mm -hmm. in which you can manifest what's necessary about you in the world that's a contribution to it. So I have to leave a space for you so that you can make your contribution for yourself, so you can take care of yourself, so that you can shoulder responsibility for your family and so that you can serve the community the best way that you can. And I don't, I don't want to set up a society that will interfere with that. But then, and then there's the association that we already talked about between res responsibility and meaning, which yeah. is absolutely crucial. And so it's, the responsibility element is more important than the rights element as far as I'm concerned, or it certainly is at this point in time. So and people know this. They it, instinctively know it. And yet, the, the, the role of the victim seems, which is a painful role to have, hmm. because something bad happened to you to be a victim, hmm. but it's something that society struggles with. Hmm. So what about people who feel like they're a victim? They're right. They're victimizers too. Like everybody is a strange mixture of victim and victimizer. Lots of terrible things happen to people that aren't justifiable in some sense. Mm -hmm. You know, well, illness strikes people randomly. Yeah. I mean, not entirely randomly, obviously, but there's a very, there's a large random element in it. Where you're thrown into existence as a consequence of your birth, that's, the, the existentialists, especially in the 1950s, talked about all that all the time. They <clears throat> talked about it as thrownness, that you're sort of thrown into reality with your particular set of predispositions and weaknesses. And, and then there's going to be times in your life where things twist in a manner that's unfair to you, that you're not getting your just desserts. But that goes along with all sorts of unequally distributed privileges as well. And so that's the arbitrary nature of existence. And, but, but you can't allow those sorts of things to define you because it's not, it's not that useful strategically. You're, when you're playing a card game, you're dealt a, you're dealt a hand of cards. Yep. Well, what do you do? You play the hand the best you can. Why? Because all the, all the hands are equal? No, because you don't have a better strategy than playing the hand that you're dealt the best you can. And that doesn't even mean it'll be a winning strategy, but because people don't always win, sometimes we lose, and sometimes we lose painfully, and sometimes we lose painfully and unjustly. Mm -hmm. That's not the point. The point is you don't have a better strategy, and neither does anyone else. And then it's also not so obvious how privilege and victimization are distributed. You know, if you take someone who's doing quite well in life, and you scratch underneath the surface, you generally don't have to scratch very far until you find one or more profound tragedies of the past or perhaps of the present. You know, and no matter how well protected you are in the world, you're still subject to illness, you're still subject to aging, you're still subject to the dissolution of your relationships, the death of your dreams, death itself. So vulnerability is built into the structure of existence. Now, if you start to regard yourself as a hapless victim, or even worse, an unfairly victimized victim, well, then things go very badly sideways for you. It's not a good strategy. You end up resentful. You end up angry. You end up vengeful. You end up hostile. And, and that's just the beginning. Things can get far more out of hand than that. So strategically, it's a bad game. 
it's better to take responsibility for the hand that you've been dealt. There's no better, you've got no better protection in life than doing that. This, this is where a lot of folks in the modern West get unsettled mm -hmm. because we have been brought up to believe that we need to be compassionate to each mm -hmm. other. And yet you point out that sometimes that compassion, I don't know if it encourages weakness mm -hmm. or it's another word for weakness. Mm -hmm. And I'd love if you could open that up for me because it is the kind of discussion that gets folks really unsettled. Well, feeling, feeling sorry for someone is not a moral yeah. virtue. You know, morality is much more complex than mere reflexive empathy. So I would say, when is reflexive empathy useful? That's easy. You're a mother. Your child is under six months old. Reflexive empathy is the right reaction. And I think that that's why it's such a powerful motivating force as well. You know, a child under six months old is always right. If a child's in distress, always right. You're wrong, the child's right. No matter what is, why the child is distressed, it's your problem and you should do something about it and it's not the infant's fault. Okay, now we have a very lengthy dependency period as human beings and that, and that means that infants... 30, and, 40 years for some. Well, well, yeah, <laughs> yes, exactly, exactly. And so because of that intense dependency, that empathic circuitry has to be very, very powerful, but it can easily be utilized in a domain that's outside of its proper purview. And unreflexive empathy is not a moral virtue. And just because you feel sorry for someone, you are not a good person. Now, that might be a subcomponent of being a good person, but it's very frequently the case that complex problems require sophisticated, complex planning, thinking, and analysis, well, which is why we invented science, for example, which is why we invented sophisticated social policy and all of that. And it's certainly not the case that everything that's good in the medium to long run looks so good in the short term. Mm -hmm. I mean, you think about when you're disciplining a child, which you have to do, because one of your responsibilities as a parent is to produce a child, help produce a child who is disciplined and who's socially acceptable to everyone else, which is your fundamental responsibility. Whenever you discipline a child, you, you cause short-term distress for the benefit of the medium to the long run. And that runs contrary to reflexive empathy. You need more than empathy to, to get by in the world. So, so it's, it's, it's unsophisticated thinking to assume that, first of all, that reflexive empathy towards those who are hypothetically unfairly victimized constitutes a moral virtue. It's not that simple and it can be very, very dangerous because you can undermine people by inappropriately feeling sorry for them. It's not helpful. So as I was listening to a, a bunch of the different talks that you've given, I was caught off guard by a comment you made in, in a series on the, on the Bible. And uh, this is an important issue because a, a lot of folks read the meek shall inherit the earth mm -hmm. and have a belief that it means the weak will inherit mm -hmm. the earth. Certainly what I thought. Mm -hmm. And uh, you stunned me by arguing that the word meek didn't really mean what we thought it meant. Mm -hmm. I looked at a bunch of different translations. Yeah, and my conclusion was, well, you know, words get translated multiple times and they shift their meaning across time. And so ancient texts are hard to interpret and it requires a fair bit of study. But my interpretation was those who have swords and know how to use them but keep, choose to keep them sheathed will inherit the earth. And that's a very, that's a much better idea as far as I'm concerned because it means that you have a moral obligation to be strong and dangerous, both of those. But to harness that and to use it in the service of good. So it, it's, it, it's, it's associated with a complex set of ideas. If but that, you're but, not, sorry, but, that, yeah. but that principle right there is a, is a stark differentiator of you from much of the material that I read. Mm -hmm. I, generally, it's purely about compassion. You use the word victimhood, mm -hmm. but a lot of folks do feel as a virtue to feel sorry for others because mm -hmm. usually behind that is virtue I'll do something. It's not that easy. No. Mm -hmm. That's the problem is that we wouldn't have to think if empathy guided us properly, but it doesn't. It guides us properly in some very specific conditions. It can also make us very dangerous because, and there's good, there's good experimental literature on this, if you're very sensitive to an in-group's claims, whatever they might be, that makes you very hostile to perceived out-group members. 
in group, out so, group, people within your tribe or yeah, outside well, with, your tribe. With, well, within whatever group it is that you're identifying with at that moment. You know, so empathy drives that in group identification. It's like, okay, well, what about the out group? Oh, those are predatory. Those are predators. We better be hard on them. You know, it's, it's a mother bear's compassion that gets you eaten. Huh. So we can't be thinking that empathy is an untrammeled virtue. There's no, there's no evidence for that whatsoever. The psychoanalysts knew this perfectly well as well when we were still wise enough to, to attend to their more profound realizations. And that's the motif of the devouring parent. The devouring mother is, the, is a more general trope. And that's someone who will do absolutely everything for you all the time so that you never have to rely on yourself for anything. That's not good. You know, there's rules, for example, if you're dealing with the elderly in an old folks home, here's a rule. Never do anything for one of your clients they can do themselves. Why? Because they're already struggling with the loss of their independence. And you want to help them maintain that independence as long as possible. And that might mean sitting by while someone struggles to do up their buttons, for example. When you can, and this is the same if you're okay. maybe helping your three-year-old dress themselves. It's like, yeah, yeah, you can put on the buttons a lot faster. Let me help you with that. It's like, no, you struggle with that. You master it. And I'll, I'll keep my empathy to myself. Thank you very much. So that I can help you maintain your independence. So. And that suffocating mother is mm -hmm. Ursula. That's right. right. And Little Mermaid. Yes. So these motifs still s sneak into our culture. Sure. Well, Why? you see it in Sleeping Beauty as well in the Disney movie where the evil queen keeps the prince locked, plans to keep Prince Charming locked into the king, locked in her basement, right. fundamentally, chained up until he's so old he's useless. Right? And, he, and she's the force that stops him from making an alliance with the young woman and, and having his life. Right? I'll just keep you chained up here while you're, where you'll be safe. It's like, no, you don't need that. You know, what did Freud say? I think it was Freud. The good mother necessarily fails, right? Because as your child emerges, as your child develops, you're a perfect mother up till six months. You take care of your child's every need. Okay, well, at somewhere between six and nine months, the child starts to crawl around, starts to become a bit autonomous, starts to be able to do little things on, on his or her own. You back off. Every time the child steps forward, you step backwards. And maybe you step backwards a little faster even to motivate your child to step forward. And then what you're saying is, it isn't you I care about, it's who you could be. And see, that's another thing that I'm talking to young men and young women about. It's like, it isn't you I care about, it's who you could be. You think, well, that's pretty harsh. It's like, not when you're talking to 18-year-olds. It's like they have their whole life ahead of them. Who sh whose side should you be on? The 18-year-old kid who's confused, oh, you're okay the way you are. It's like, no, you're not. You're not even close to okay the way you are. You haven't even started. You're not who you could be physically. You're not who you could be spiritually. You're not educated to the degree you could be. You could really be something, man. You got 60 years to work on it. Get the hell at it. That's way better. That's a way more positive message, even though it's got that strange harshness about it because it's judgmental. Every ideal is a judge. You can't get away with it. Get, can't get away from it, right? Mm -hmm. Or with it. You put something up as an ideal that it, it stares down at you and says, you are not what you could be. Every great piece of art does that. And to s tell young people, it's like, no, no, you're not okay the way you are. That's why we have universities. That's why we have training programs. It's like you don't know enough to go out there and change the world. You're not out there waving placards around and telling people how to behave. Get your act together. Learn some skills. Educate yourself. Learn how to speak. Learn how to conduct yourself. Learn how to stand up. Make yourself a force in the world. There's way more to you than you think. You appreciate why that message would resonate with some but scare the heck out of others. It should scare the heck out of everybody. You know, that what they say. Fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. Like, there's real truth in that. And this is a... See, I think, and this is what scared me. I learned from studying Auschwitz and the terrible things that I studied for many, many years that I was responsible for them. Yeah. And I believe that. Yes, because it's, it comes down to individual integrity. All of these things. If the state is corrupting around you, that's on you. It's your responsibility. You think, well, how can I take on that responsibility? It's like, be more than you are. So and, and how, how could you not be afraid of that? Well, of course you'd want to shy away from that. But the alternative is far worse. It's far worse to let things degenerate. Like you have a chance, you have the, 
you have the opportunity to contend with the structure of reality and to set things right. You can do that if you take it on voluntarily. And that's a terrible burden to confront suffering and malevolence, especially given the degree of malevolence. It's a terrible thing to confront. The alternative is worse. Let things slide. You just see where you end up there. At least you have a fighting chance if you're a contender, right? You're in the ring and, there's, and, and, you, can, and you can do it. That's the thing. That's, that's, the, that's what makes me so fundamentally optimistic about people, is that the, the problems that confront us are, are most infinite in their catastrophic consequence. But there's something within us that's even greater than that. And so that's, that's the fundamental reality. You don't get to that either unless you start with what's so terrible. Say, life is rife with suffering and injustice. And we make it worse with our malevolence. It's terrible. Okay, well, that's horrible. Who can withstand that? It's like, yeah, well, if you look inside that, you see that something beckons. And what beckons is the possibility of what you could become if you confront that. And that's what we need to know. And, th and that's, I think, integrally tied up with our most fundamental religious convictions. We know that people have an indomitable divine spirit. Well, how do you call that forth? Well, by challenging it. It's not going to come out without that. You're not going to be who you could be without pushing yourself to your limit. Because why would you be? It's not like it's easy. You have to be compelled in some sense. You have to be challenged. And that's why you do your children no favors by, by overprotecting them. Quite the contrary. Why does that message make you so emotional? And what were you like at age 18? You're in Saskatchewan, I believe. Alberta at Alberta. that time, yeah. Well, I was thinking about the sorts of things that we're talking about now. I've been thinking about them ever since I can remember. But, you know, I've got better at thinking about them across time. But I was... I had a lot of the problems, I suppose, that the typical 18-year-old would have. I drank a lot. I came, come from this little town in northern Alberta. Heavy drinking. I started drinking when I was 14. Um, so I was quite a partier. Um, I... I was confused existentially, I would say. I wasn't sure what the proper direction in life was. I was very much obsessed with the problem of the Cold War. That's never really gone away because that seemed to me to be just a, a, a kind of insanity that I didn't know how to fathom. And, you know, it was all of that. that and I was obsessed with reading and obsessed with learning. And so that was what all drove me in this direction. And then as I started to develop these ideas, like I had to let go of things. You know, one of the ideas that I've been promoting to people is that you have to let the dead wood burn off. And you do that by, you do that as a consequence of necessity in the pursuit of responsibility. When I started writing seriously, I had to stop drinking. Because I couldn't think properly. So that was it. It was either like, you're going to do one of these or the other. Mm -hmm. You're either going to continue wasting your time. I was having a fine time. I was in graduate school and, 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 and I had a very social, I was very, very social. And a lot of that involved drinking and, and, and that sort of thing. Couldn't do both. Especially when I was editing. I couldn't get my thoughts down pristinely enough, precisely enough. Plus the, the emotional magnitude of the things that I was dealing with were more overwhelming if I was, well, in the aftermath of a party. You know, so I decided when I was like 25 or so to just stop. I've, I've been caught off guard by how politicized you've become. And I, mm -hmm. you know, as I read of your youth, I know that you had your run-ins with religion, which a lot of people do. You actually got politically active, but on the left, not the right. Mm -hmm. Help me understand what went down. Well, I, in, the, in the little town I grew up in, the, the member of parliament, the, the provincial parliament, equivalent to American state, was a democratic socialist. He was the only one in the entire province. Everyone else was conservative, which would be sort of moderate Republican, I would say. And, uh, you know, there's something to be said for political voice for the working class and for the dispossessed. And it, it certainly is the case that hierarchical structures, the hierarchical structures that compose our society, do produce dispossession. They stack people up at the bottom. And, and so people at the bottom need to have a political voice. And so I was very attracted to that end of the political spectrum. But as I came to investigate some of the problems I've been discussing more deeply, I started to understand that mere economic rectification was insufficient. 
that that wasn't the level of analysis that was appropriate for my inquiry anyways. Translated, and, redistribution of income doesn't work. Well, think about it this way. The guaranteed basic income idea. It's like, well, that's predicated on the idea that man lives by bread alone. Well, that isn't how it works, and I've certainly seen that in my clinical practice. I've had clients, especially addicts, if you gave them money, they would die. And the reason for that, like one guy that I remember in particular, I liked him quite a bit. He had a bad cocaine problem. And uh, as long as he was flat broke, he wasn't dead. But as soon as his, he was on disability, as soon as his disability check came in, he was face down in the ditch three days later. So, well, and you think, well, maybe that's a consequence of his overwhelming poverty, etc. You could come up with some social reason for the, that path that he took, but it wasn't by any stretch of the imagination that simple. It's like people need purpose more than money, even. I mean, obviously, we don't want people starving. And actually, we're doing a pretty good job of solving that problem worldwide. You know, the UN projects that there won't be anyone in absolute poverty by the year 2030, mm -hmm. which is really a, quite the bloody miracle, that's for sure. So we're doing a pretty good job of getting rid of abject privation. But then it isn't the provision of material well-being with ease that allows people to live properly, even though a certain amount of material wealth is, is a necessary precondition. It's purpose. And that's a much more difficult problem to solve. It's like we need something to grapple with. We need a meaning to justify our lives. And some of that is to be found in, well, the struggle against, against privation and, and malevolence. The mere offering of material sustenance to people isn't going to solve the problem. Dostoevsky knew this 150 years ago. He said if you gave people everything they wanted, so all they had to do was eat cakes and busy themselves with the continuation of the species. The first thing they do is smash it all to hell so that something interesting could happen. He said that's our fatal, our fatal flaw and salvation, both of that, that, that wanting to contend rather than to sit back and have everything taken care of. So how, how, so how do we get an 18-year-old to understand what Dostoevsky wrote 150 years ago? How do you get a, a 38 or a 58-year-old, mm. which is my age, to understand how to take responsibility. No, we have discussions like this, you know, and you make the case to people as well. So I've been touring around. My wife and I <clears throat> have gone to 60 cities now mm. since January of this year. And I've been speaking to audiences that average 2,500 people. And I have a, I deliver a lecture that's very much like this conversation. It's like, lay out the structure of life, the fact that it's rife with suffering and malevolence, that we erect hierarchies in an attempt to deal with that, to, to deal with those problems, because they're too alike, that the hierarchies dispossess people, and so we have to take care of the dispossessed as well, and to draw out the relationship between meaning and responsibility. And the audiences are wrapped as a consequence of that. You know, and I'm always listening to my audiences as, when are they silent? Mm -hmm. Because, you know, when everyone in an audience is silent, then everyone's in the same place. That's a meaningful place. They're all lined up, and they line up on this axis of responsibility and meaning. So there's a hole in our culture where this information hasn't been provided. But it was there at, at times in our history, which mm -hmm. has been the thing that, that I struggle with, which is the issue of sacrifice. It's so paradoxical, right? Why would me giving of myself to you mm -hmm. make me feel better? Mm -hmm. It does seem like most of the time, if, I'm, if I have money, I give you some of my money, I have less money. Mm -hmm. But you're arguing that if I understand true sacrifice and I sacrifice myself for something that has meaning. Mm -hmm. Well, part of it is, you know, human beings discovered time. That's one of the things that makes us very peculiar creatures. To be aware of our own mortality is a consequence of the discovery of time, right? We can see how we extend out into the future. And so that makes us very strange creatures as as selfish creatures yeah. because you actually can't be narrowly selfish and survive and here's the reason you have to take care of yourself now so let's say well then you can pursue impulsive pleasure perhaps at the expense of other people mm -hmm. and why not well here's one reason why not there isn't just you now there's you tomorrow there's you next week there's you next month and next yes. year and ten years from now and so if you conduct yourself in a manner in the present 
that interferes with your future selves, then that's a downhill trip for you. And so taking care of yourself in the future and taking care of other people actually turns out to be exactly the same thing. Because you're actually a community of people that's distributed across time. And so if you act in your own best interest, then you're going to sacrifice some of the present for the future. And that was one of the great discoveries of mankind, right? Which is something that I also concentrate on in 12 Rules because I'm really interested in the issue of sacrifice. Why would you give up something now? Why would you ever give up something now voluntarily? And the answer is sometimes if you give up something now, and often something you love, something you're very in love with even, perhaps not, not for the best reasons, then you can make a bargain with the future. And that bargain with the future isn't any different than the bargain you make with other people. Mm -hmm. So that narrow selfishness is blindness to time and context. And there's nothing about it that's good. And I do think the musical example is a really, is a really good one. Like in a musical piece, every note has to fit with every other note across the entire span of the piece. Well, that's what your life needs to be like, is like how you act with me right now is has to be in harmony with what you want for yourself tomorrow. And, and that's going to be tangled in as well. It's not only that you repeat across time and have to take that into account. It's that you repeat across time in the context of your social life. And so all of that has to be brought into the equation. And the sacrificial motif is a huge part of that. And, and that also is something that runs contrary in some sense to empathy. Because sometimes you have to, you know, you have to beat yourself on the back of the head with a stick to get yourself to move forward properly, even though you know. I should be doing this. I should be doing this. Well, I don't want to. It's hard. It's like no sympathy for that. It's you have to do it because otherwise things are going to get worse. Well, I heard you say that you're, you're, you're quoting one of the Ten Commandments saying you do unto your uh, neighbors as you have them do unto you. And the word nice is not in that commandment. No, no. Well, nice isn't enough. You know, and, and this... Is it not enough or is it not the right thing to expect because... So many members of my audience beat themselves up in a way they would never hurt other oh, people. Oh, yes, that's right? definitely. And they say yes. they're thinking, but most thinking is self-flagellation. Mm -hmm. Oh, so yes. So part definitely. of it is, right, is, you know, take it easy on yourself. Be yes. fair. On the other hand, sometimes you tolerate stuff from other people because you teach people how to treat you. Mm -hmm. And if you yeah, don't well, getting, do that, you get it. Well, getting that balance right is really hard. So in rule, rule two, I think, is treat yourself as if you're someone response, treat yourself like you're someone responsible for helping. And that, that, I was really interested in that issue of people mistreating themselves, you know, so because we are pri privy to our own weaknesses and faults. We know them better than anyone else knows them. And so it's very easy for us to determine that we're not worthwhile because of all the ways that we don't live up to what we should live up to and the painful knowledge we have of that and to not regard ourselves as worthwhile and to not treat ourselves properly. And that's not good. You, you have to treat yourself as if you're valuable. And then that is the same attitude that you extend to other people. Well, and it's because you are valuable. So, and, you, and, and that it's a necessity to adopt the responsibility that goes along with recognizing that. So even if you're not happy with who you are, and even if you have your reasons, you still deserve presumption of innocence. You still deserve to have a good defense mounted on your own behalf. You still need to treat yourself as if you're someone valuable and, and, and someone worthy of love, even though you have all reasons to know why you fall short. Yeah. And that's absolutely crucial, and it is hard for people to learn that. Hard, to, hard for them to learn not to beat themselves up too much. Then why doesn't anyone ever get away with anything? That's one of your lines. Well, I think, imagine you have a plastic ruler, you know, and you pull it back in front of your face. <laughs> and you let go. It's like, <laughs> you think, well, this is going pretty well so far. Right. Snap. <laughs> yeah, well, it's because you can't, you can't bend the structure of reality. This is why, and this is, I think, also partly what in this message is frightening, is everything that you distort snaps back and often magnified, and everyone knows that. And one of the things I discuss with my audience is, is like, well, just think about how you talk to people that you're trying to be, trying to treat properly. You don't say to them, okay, here, kid, here's the way you deal with life. This is, you put your son on your knee and say, look, lie every chance you get. Falsify things. Don't take any responsibility for anything. If you can slough it off to someone else, if you can hide things where no one will find them, that's a hell of a good strategy. Like, no one believes that, ever. 
So we know that that doesn't work. Now, we're tempted because now and then you think, well, I can just cut a corner here or I can get away with this and no one will find out. It's like, yeah, they will. They'll find out or you'll find out. And I saw this in my clinical practice all the time. You know, people would be suffering for some consequence, yeah. a lot, and we'd untangle it. Maybe we'd go back five years or ten years and it would be something that was left undone, or something that was done that shouldn't have been done. Not, and sometimes not even on the part of the person, you know, sometimes on the part of their parents or maybe even on the part of their grandparents. Like these things stick around for a very long period of time. But it's like if you, if you produce a rift in the structure of reality, it's not going to go away until you rectify it. And, and often it breeds more demons, that's for sure. Well, if that's the case, why is it so hard for us to tell the truth? What, what is it biologically in us? And what I, I, mean, I like to push you on these biologic issues because yeah. you're a psychologist. You yeah. actually understand how the brain works and how, you know, in fact, the, the fundamental order versus chaos issue is in part reflected in our brain. So all these balancing acts our brain's pretty good at, yet yeah, truth is hard for us. Yeah. Well, you know, it's hard to confront things now when you could hypothetically put them off. It's discounted a bit. You know, a child who's called onto the carpet for their actions is likely to think, well, if I lie about this, I'm not going to get punished for it now. I can get away with it. And they might not even really believe that, but they don't want to face the consequences of their actions right here and now. Well, we can just put it off a little bit. Well, it'd be nice if you could do that. And so you're tempted to do it. You can shunt it off into the future. That's just future you, yeah. you know. You don't want to be that guy. No, you don't. Yeah, but, but it's, it's better. It's better to have the fight now. It's better to confront it now if you can manage it. You touched earlier on this issue of the evil within us. Yeah. And you use stories a lot. And in, in some of them are stories that all of us are familiar with, Harry Potter being a good one for this yeah. example, where there's a little bit of evil in Harry Potter. Yeah, darkness. Darkness, yeah. the shadow. Yeah. Right, Voldemort. In yeah, story. right. Uh, what is it about having or respecting that we all have evil that you find is important for us living our lives? Well, I think the capacity for evil is something that is not easily distinguishable from strength. You know, and, and I mean, my, my knowledge runs out at this level of analysis in some sense. The world seems to be structured so that we have, that we can act for the good and we can act for evil. And I think that's associated with self-consciousness. And I think that's illustrated in the story of Adam and Eve. When Adam and Eve become self-conscious, the scales from, fall from their eyes. They realize that they're naked. And to realize that you're naked is to understand your vulnerability. That's why Adam and Eve clothed themselves right away. Oh, no, I'm naked. I can be hurt. Okay, I can be hurt. I have to clothe myself. I have to protect myself in the future. You actually become aware of that in a way that animals aren't. Well, what does it mean that you're naked? It means that everyone else is too. Yeah. What does it mean that you can be hurt? It means that everyone else can be hurt too. It means that you could hurt them. And that's why the knowledge of good and evil goes along with the knowledge of nakedness. That took me a long time to figure out. It took me about 30 years to figure that out. So why are those two things conjoined? Oh, yes. When you understand that you're vulnerable, you understand that everyone else is vulnerable, and then you have the option of exploiting that. And so that, that's what transforms human beings to some degree from animals, because a predator just eats you. But a human being, a human being can play with you and will for all sorts of reasons. Now... The capacity to do that, though, why is the capacity to do that, let's say, useful? Well, it's useful to be strong and not to have to use it. That reflects something that we talked about earlier, because it makes you formidable. And I think that you have to be formidable in order to move forward properly in the world, even to get through obstacles that aren't... Just to get through obstacles. You have to have some strength of character. You have to have some commitment. And some of that is... There will be a cost if you interfere with me. It'll be the minimal cost necessary. Let's say if, you're, if you've got yourself under control. It will be the minimal cost necessary. But do not be thinking there won't be a cost. And I don't think, I don't believe that if that's not built into your character, then you have, you have no strength. And you certainly have no strength when you're pushed by someone who's malevolent. A bully, if you're like that, if the bully pushes you, and your response is, there will be a cost for pushing me, and you will pay it. 
then the bully will go elsewhere. And we know that too from studies of bullies, you know, like even ch childhood bullies. They push around they kids and then they find the ones that retreat and withdraw and they bully them. So, and you know, you might think, well, usually children are bullied because of some abnormality. That's a very common idea. It's like there's a guy named Dan Olwys, a very smart Norwegian psychologist, and he studied bullying for a long time as a precursor to fascism, by the way, so that was his interest. He said his analysis indicated that at least three-quarters of children have some obvious abnormality that could be the focus of bullying attention. It might even be your name. It doesn't take much of a genius bully to come up with a good way of making fun of your name, yeah. or you're too tall, or you're too short, or, you know, or or your brother's too tall or too short, or there's something. It isn't the abnormality that is the cause of the bullying. It's the abnormality might become the focus of the bullying, but part of the cause is the withdrawal in the face of the bullies, because the bully thinks he can get away with it. Well, if, if you're, and it's also the case with children who are preyed upon by adult predators. Like adult predators of children look for children who are easily cowed and who won't put up a fight. So, for example, if you're teaching your children to be terrified of strangers, that's really not a very good strategy. You want kids who are confident and who will make a noise if someone messes about with them and who are... Who are, who are and so that, that, that characterological strength has to be built in. Let me play to that, the, the evil side of that equation. We do a lot of shows on true crime mm -hmm. through the lens of a, of a doctor. I'm interested mm -hmm. in the forensics and mm -hmm. what went down emotionally, psychologically. What creates e evil? What is the nature of evil? I mean, Solzhenitsyn wrote about this yeah. after unbelievable evil that he witnessed and lived through in, in Soviet Russia. Mm. So some people see it and can react and respond and, and they survive. Mm. Others wilt away. What, but what caused the evil? There are levels. Well, some of, it's, some of it's like moronic evil, you might say. It's like, well, someone has something you don't and you want it. That's just theft bicycle theft or something like that. It's pure material greed. And then I guess the level after that would be something like, well, the, the, the desire to cause harm because you're vengeful. And that's where the idea that you're a victim starts to play a real role. If you're a victim and things are unfair, then it's okay for you to react and to, and to lash out and to hurt. And so then there's the, the conscious desire to actually produce suffering. And then that can just expand beyond anyone's imagination until what you're trying to do is take, I think, like the, that, that, that maximizes out when you're trying to take revenge against God for the structure of reality itself. And I think that's the right language. So when, when people, <clears throat> and you see approximations of this with the high school shooters and people like that, especially the guy who shot up the elementary school. Yeah, Sandy Hook. Yeah, you bet. You've got you to gotta go to a pretty damn dark place before you think that the right thing to do with your life is to make people fundamentally identifiable because of their innocence and lack of wrongdoing, the target of your vengeful hatred. You've gone somewhere unbelievably dark to get there, but that's not the darkest place you can go. It's certainly a suburb of the darkest place you can go. You know, you can, you can go to where Hitler went and try to cook up a strategy for destroying everything. You know, I mean, everyone says, well, Hitler was trying to dominate the world. It's like, well... Maybe Hitler was trying to set up a particularly dramatic, for, dramatic form for suicide with Europe in flames. That's what he did. You know, you've mentioned totalitarian governments, Nazis in particular, several yeah. times. One of the knocks on you is that Nazis come to your rallies. Oh, yes. Yeah, so it's such complete, utter nonsense. It's absolutely reprehensible, all of that. Why, do, mean, they, why do they come to your rallies? What they are they don't. looking for? There's no evidence for that at all. The alt-right types don't like me at all. There's lots of documentation of that. And the reason they don't like me is because I don't like people who play identity politics. And I don't care if they're on the left <clears> or the right. You know, the left says, here's the victimized groups and our society is basically an oppressor oppressed society and we should do everything we can to lift up the oppressed. And I don't know what we're doing with the oppressors, but I don't imagine it'll be that pleasant. And the the identity politics types on the right say, oh yes, we should play identity politics, but we'll be white ethno-nationalists and look for white superiority or a white ethno-state. It's like, as far as I'm concerned, none of those, none of that's even vaguely, it's, it's reprehensible. It's thoroughly reprehensible on all fronts. 
the reason that this all came about, there's complicated reasons, but because I'm not a fan of the collectivist left, let's say, it's been in the interest of people who push that doctrine to paint me as the most radical of opponents, which of course would put me in the far right camp. But just because you're no fan of people who play identity politics doesn't mean you're part of the alt-right. So that's, that's been a strategy, I think, that's been, what would you say, put into play against me for a variety of reasons that has been somewhat successful, but not very in the final analysis. If, uh, maybe it's the wrong axis to put you on, but if zero is the ultra, you know, ultra-liberal and 100 is the ultra-conservative, alt-right, where are you on that spectrum? You think of yourself as more conservative, more liberal? I know in your life you've changed. Well, I'm a traditionalist in many senses, you know, but I'm a very creative person, so it's very difficult temperamentally for me to place myself on the political spectrum. It's not like I don't think that the dispossessed deserve a political voice. You know, that's why I was interested in socialist politics when I was a kid, and I understand perfectly well that hierarchies dispossess and that something has to be done about that. But I'm also, I also think that we mess with fundamental social structures at our great peril. I think we've destabilized marriage very badly and that that's, been, that's not been good for people, especially not good for children. But I don't think it's been good for adult men and women either. Mm -hmm. And I certainly, as a social scientist, one of the things you learn if you're a social scientist and you're well educated and, and informed is that if you take a complex system Let's imagine you have a complex system and you have a hypothesis about how to intervene so that it will improve. Okay, so what will you learn? You'll learn once you implement the intervention that you didn't understand the system and that your stupid intervention did a bunch of things you didn't expect it to, many of which ran counter to your original intent. And you will inevitably learn that. So uh, I, I learned that. I had a whole series of very wise mentors who insisted to everyone they talked to who was interested in public policy, for example, that when they put in place a well-meaning public policy initiative, that they put aside a substantial proportion of the budget to evaluate the outcome of the initiative, because the probability that the initiative would produce the results desired was virtually zero. And I believe that that's technically true. And so that tilts me in the conservative direction, because I think, well, that's sort of working, that system. And I'm also not a utopian, so I don't expect systems to work perfectly. If they're not degenerating into absolute tyranny, I tend to think they're doing quite well. Because if you look worldwide and you look at the entire course of human history, degeneration into abject tyranny is the norm. And so if you see systems like our systems, say in the, in the democratic Western world, that are struggling by not too badly, it's like you should be in awe of those structures because they're so difficult to produce and so unlikely. And then I think, well, you take a system that's working not too badly. You think, well, I'm going to radically improve it. It's like, no, you're not. You're not going to radically improve it. You might be able to improve it incrementally if you devoted a large part of your entire life to it and you were very humble about your methods and, and your ambition. But if you think that some caref careless tweak of this complex system as a consequence of the ideological presuppositions you learned in three weeks in your social justice class at university and that's going to produce a radical improvement, it's like you, 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 you can't even begin to fathom the depths of your ignorance. You, you mentioned marriage as an example mm -hmm. of this. As a, as a social psychologist, what happened to marriage? Well, I think a bunch of things happened. I mean one thing that happened might be that we live a lot longer than we did. So the problem of having a relationship that extends over decades is a different problem than having the problem of having a relationship that extends over the period of time where you might have kids. So I think there's that. I think that women have clearly become more autonomous and so they've been able to transcend their more limited roles. Those roles, by the way, weren't imposed upon them by patriarchal men. I think that's a reprehensible view of history because I think men and women fundamentally served as mutually sustaining partners throughout the course of history, despite 
their continual disagreements and the difficulties of life. Women were relegated to a more restricted role because they lacked sanitation, they lacked tampons, they lacked birth control. And those problems have been solved in the last hundred years, essentially, since about 1895. And so that's freed women to participate in a much broader sense than they were able to before. Uh, but we don't want to underestimate the power of those technological revolutions, even though they sound rather mundane. They're not mundane at all, especially not the birth control pill. Um, that's put a certain amount of stress on marriage because the traditional roles have been expanded. And you might think, well, that's great. It's like, yeah, it is. It is, it, it is great in that a broader range of people have access to the expression of a fuller range of their talents and in principle that's good for them and definitely it's good for the rest of society because now we have access to the genius of women let's say too but that's made negotiating the marital role more difficult and then the other thing that's happened as far as I'm concerned is that we we got a little too careless about liberalizing the divorce laws and changing the, the structure of marriage in general I don't think that that was good for people, especially not for children. Because the evidence, the evidence that children do better in intact two-parent families is overwhelming. No credible social scientist that I know of disputes that. So, and it might be because the minimal viable social structure is actually the minimal nuclear family, two people. One isn't enough. Two is barely enough but it's a minimum, especially, and I think the reason for that is, this is how I look at it. Everybody has lots of flaws and tilts towards insanity in at least one direction. And so partly what you want to do is you want to link up with someone over the long run because they're, they might be sane where you're not and vice versa. So if you have a partner and you put yourself together, and this is also how marriage works symbolically, by the way. It's the reunion of the original man before the separation into man and woman. You put yourself together. You have one person who's basically sane. And so that maximizes the probability that you'll do reasonably well throughout your life course. But it also makes the pair of you, especially if you're communicating, sufficiently sane so that you're a foundation for the raising of children who will be socially competent and access, accept, acceptable. Because if they have parents, if they have a parental unit, let's say, that's communicating and that's straightening each other out, then the child can adapt to that unit as a microcosm of broader society. And so if the child can figure out how to get along with the parents in, 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 the, in the best possible sense, then they're also simultaneously figuring out how to get along with everyone else. So, and I think if you go below that pairing, things fragment in a way that can't be easily rectified. I, I know that you're getting emotional talking about some parts of, of this discussion, in part when you talk about meaning and responsibility. Mm. I don't know if that touches you more well, personally than others or... Well, deeper. I think it's a consequence actually of many of the things that I've experienced over the last, especially the last six or seven months. So I meet 150 people or so at each of these events personally and many of them have stories to tell me and they tell me overwhelming stories and that has a cumulative effect on you so one kid for example I, he was in his early 20s I would say he came up to me and he said I don't want to take up too much of your time but a year and a half ago I just got out of jail and I was homeless I started watching your lectures he said I'm married I have a daughter and I just bought my first apartment it's like good work and I was in L.A. and I was outside the Orpheum Theater. It's kind of rough in downtown L.A. And I was walking down the street with my wife. And this car pulled up beside us. And this kid hopped out, Latino kid, about 19 or so. And he said, are you Dr. Peterson? I said, yes. He said, oh, I'm really happy to meet you. And, and he shook my hand. He said, and, and I've been watching your lectures. And just wait a minute, wait a minute. And, and I said, okay, okay. And then he ran back to his car and he got his dad out. And they came over and... They had, he had his arm, they had their arms around each other. And they were just smiling away, you know, like with a real Duchenne smile, a real smile. And he said, I've been watching your lectures, and I've really been working on 
putting my relationship with my father together and it's really worked. And so I thought, well, that's a lovely thing to have happen when you're walking through a rough neighborhood is that some kid jumps out of his car and comes rushing over and tells you how much better his life is because he's been working hard on the basis of your recommendation to fix his relationship with his father. And people are telling me stories like this all the time. And then, and the thing that's sad about it, I think, and this is what makes me emotional, is not only that this is so good, and, and, and sad, good at a level that transcends politics, absolutely, but that people require so little encouragement. You know, there's so many people I see in my, in my lectures, and I have a very diverse range of people who come to my lectures. They're starving for encouragement, and they don't need much. I said, I had this kid talk to me at a, a barbecue I was at this weekend, and he's working with delinquent kids, 13 and 14 years old. And he said, they were pulled out of other delinquent camps and brought to his camp, which was for the worst delinquents. And he started talking to them about my lectures. And so they've been watching him, and now they have a little fan club that's based around my lectures, and they're doing things like talking to each other about making their beds and cleaning up their rooms. It's like, it's, it's unbelievable how little genuine encouragement many people need and how, and how they had none. No one ever said to them and meant it. It's not okay for you to be a weak loser. It's not okay. And the reason it's not okay is because you could be way more than that. And it's a crime, an ethical crime, for you to allow all that necessary potential to go to waste. It hurts you, it hurts your family, it hurts the world. Really, really, it does. And people think, oh, okay, I get it. And they do get it, because they know at some level the other thing people tell me, you know, they say, well, I've been paying attention to your lectures, developing a vision for my life, trying to tell the truth, trying to adopt more responsibility, and things are way better. But the other story is, you've been able to help me put into words things I always knew to be true, but didn't know how to say, which is a good role for an intellectual to play. And so, well, so those are, that's why this all makes me emotional. It's so, it's so good you know, and so much of this has been covered as if it's political. It's not political what I'm doing. It's not political. It's something that politics is nested inside. Politics is nested inside the healthy sovereignty of the individual. Now, I'm working to buttress and sustain the healthy sovereignty of the individual. The great idea of the West. So, Is it worth it? Is the pain that you must feel with some of the biting criticism that you witness here about yourself, is it worth it? Oh, absolutely, and absolutely. And, you know, I'm not so naive as to think you can get the good without the bad. You know, I've, I've had a discussions with my publicists, say, and, and the people who are working on my book, and, and sometimes the discussions are such that, well, maybe a little less controversy would be a good thing. It's like. It's hard to say what's a good thing. You know, and what's happened to me over the past two years, fortunately, is that every time I've been attacked, the net outcome has been in my favor. Even though it's very painful in the, in the immediate, well, when it's happening with the mobs of students, for example, or with a particularly um, reprehensible press piece, some of which, some of the press pieces, people who were very close to me told me they thought they sunk me. And I mean, I watch people respond to these things, and very frequently now, if someone's mobbed in social media, they, they apologize, they're done with one episode, you know, and this has probably happened to me a hundred times in the last two years. So it's very stressful, but I'm kind of detached from it, because we'll see how it plays out. You know, and you can't do difficult things without them being difficult. And so I'm not, I don't feel 
that it's been, what do we say, how to, how to say it exactly? I'm perfectly satisfied with the way things are going, especially with these lectures, because they're so positive. So how do you want to be remembered years from now when the world looks back on what we're witnessing right now? What should people say about Jordan Peterson? That he wanted the best for people, not the worst. And the reason I want the best, I think, is because I know a fair bit about what the worst is like. And I definitely don't want that. And that's a conscious decision to turn away from that. It's like, enough hell. That's the lesson of the 20th century. And so it means that we take responsibility for that. And we put the world together and we start with ourselves. And we do that by adopting responsibility, not by fixing someone else, and not even by fixing social structures. They're not that easy to fix. It's like, start with yourself. You're a fixer-upper, man. You got work to do. Get at it. Then maybe you'll develop enough wisdom so that you'll be good for someone other than you. And then you can expand that outward. So, I would like the best for people. I think when people look back on you, they'll also see that you began to tie together seemingly disparate parts mm -hmm. of who we are mm -hmm. as a species. And I, I'd like to get into that because it's deep stuff, but you are articulated in a way that I think people will understand. Let's start with the soul. Mm -hmm. This idea that we have something that for most people is this amorphous part of us, but you argue that it was in our parents, that it's out through all of us, it's mm. a much bigger concept than I had heard. Mm. Yeah, well, I think, see, uh, this is how I think reality lays itself out. I think we all know this. You're not driven by your past like a clock. You're not deterministic. You are to some degree, because you're limited. You're a limited creature. You've got rules that you run by and all of that. You know, you're not omniscient. But... You don't, you're not driven by the past. What you do instead is confront the potential of the future. That's what's in front of you. So it's a, it's a, it's a domain with multiple pathways, and that's what's always in front of you. You could go there, you could go there, you could go there. There's, there's a, an array of choices that confront you. you. You confront that as soon as you wake up and become conscious in the morning. Mm -hmm. And then there's all this potential that's there in front of you, and you use your ethical choice to determine which of those possibilities will become actual. And it's, it's through that mechanism that you participate in the creation of reality. And that's the making of you in the image of God, because that's what God did at the beginning of time, according to our old stories, right? Spoke and transformed potential into, into the being that was good. And that was dependent on using truthful speech. So that's what you do if you act properly, mm -hmm. is you confront potential and you translate it into reality and it's your soul that does that your soul makes that translation hmm. but the soul for you is bigger than just in me right it's a part of almost like our collective unconsciousness touches all of us our soul seems to be bigger than just what's inside of us it's connected well, it's also the thing that's the same between us in some sense right i mean it's it's a funny thing because you're you're a singular being possessed of this creative consciousness, but so am I. So it's a fa strange kind of singularity because we share it. And it, it's the thing that unites us in some sense as, 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 as sovereign individuals. Right, so how does faith play a role in all this? And faith, again, is I, I gather that if you act appropriately, you'll have a better life. Good stuff will happen to you. Is that what faith is? I think you make a decision about whether, about what your fundamental attitude towards being is going to be. I think that's faith. It's like, well, are things bad or good? It's like, well, there's a lot of evidence they're bad. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of evidence they're good. Where are you going to come down on that? Should you work to make things better? Or should you work for their annihilation? These are decisions that you make, and I think they're, they're fundamentally based on something like faith. 
the, your decision to confront the unknown and the things that frighten you. It's like, well, do you have faith in your potential? Do you have faith in what you could call forward out of you? Because you need that in order to move forward with confidence. You want to instill faith. I mean, we know this. If you're trying to raise a child, you want to instill faith in them. Now, you might not say, well, I'm instilling faith in God. It's like, well, it's not so easy to decide when you're doing that. But to instill in your child a, the faith in the ability of their own potential to unfold in a positive direction, well, that's faith. That's what, that's what you want for someone who's confident. It's like, yes, in absence of evidence, in, absence, in, in the absence of certain evidence, I believe that my commitment to this path of action will bear fruit. All right, so let's take this discussion. And, and I think make it practical. So one yeah. of the biggest battles that I sense in America, mm -hmm. North America, so I'll throw the West, is that between religion and science. Mm -hmm. And in many ways, this is the fracture that you quote Nietzsche is speaking to when he said God was dead. Mm -hmm. uh, not as a good thing. No, it not led as to, a good thing. And led to the totalitarian ideology of much of the last century. But yeah. let's just take it right till today to North America in particular. And... Our brains hardwired to look at this information differently. Religion made it possible to have inquisitive minds that led to science. Religion also placed in all of us this belief that there's some divinity in us, yes. something special in all of us. And you very thoughtfully speak about how science talks about what is. And how can people watch us right now or see us or hear us? The technology is remarkable. But religion is not really designed, uh, but science is not designed to talk about what it means. It's what should be. What should be. Yes, that's, so, that's some, so there has to be something beyond that. You know, and I believe that, like I believe that the description that I just gave you of human consciousness is act actually scientifically accurate. I think that we do confront potential and that we do cast it into reality. I think if you understand how the brain works from its ability to first grapple with what's unknown in physical representation and then to represent it in image and then to represent it in word, I think that what you see is the process of potential coming into reality. So I don't think that there's anything that's, that's not commensurate with the scientific viewpoint there. I also think that if we act as if we're each divine centers of consciousness of that sort, then we treat ourselves properly, mm -hmm. think, well, you've got some intrinsic value. Yeah. You treat other people properly because I'm duty-bound to treat you as if you have some intrinsic value. We build social structures on that predicate, they work. So the idea that the individual is sovereign in some divine sense, if you act that out politically, it's like, hey, your society functions and people don't starve and, and, and things aren't an absolute abject tyranny. And your rulers have something to bow to, that principle of intrinsic sovereignty. Now, the question is how that might be related to some metaphysical reality, because that's the question of God. And the way I don't know exactly how to answer that, except that I've seen this relationship, say, between the opening statements in Genesis, which describe God as this being that uses communicative intent to call forth being out of possibility, and that that's... that's that's the essence of God as portrayed in Genesis, and that's built into us as an image. I think, okay, well, that's what our whole society is predicated on, and that works, so it seems to me that there's something true about that. I don't know what the fundamental relationship is between consciousness and the soul and the metaphysics of being, but I'm certainly unwilling to assume that this is all meaningless and random. I don't believe that. I don't think that's a good theory. I don't think it works at all when you act it out. So there's something wrong with it. And I don't think there's any evidence that it's true. So people say, well, do you believe in God? And I think, I think a bunch of things when I'm asked that question. It's like, why are you asking? What do you mean God? What do you mean believe? It's like, then those are reasonable objections for a question that complex. But I think a better answer is, I act as if God exists. You say, well, does that mean you believe? It's like, well... What you believe is most appropriately expressed in your action. Mm -hmm. So, and I think, what's the saying? By their fruits you will know them. That's an action-oriented idea. It's like, so that's enough belief to stake my existence on. But that doesn't mean I'm certain of it. How could you be certain of it? It's not within the human 
It's not within the realm of human capacity to be certain about such a thing. And so you have to stake something on it. It's like, I act as if it's true. That's as good as, it, as I can manage. And I don't think there's a more appropriate answer than that. It's like, it's up to you to take it from, I, from there in I, some sense. I think part of the reason that you've become so popular is because you take religion and you allow us to see the fundamental grammar mm -hmm. that is offered by different religions mm -hmm. without people having to first make the very important step of deciding whether they believe or not. I know for a lot of people right. listening there, that's going to be a bit of a struggle, but it is one of the more rewarding aspects of reading yes. or listening to you. And I do think it, that a lot of people will come to either a conclusion you just offered, which is I can live my life that way and the fruits of my action will yeah. be bestowed on my, my family and my life. Uh, and many will just decide they believe, period, because it makes sense, because there's yeah. so much wisdom in these writings, no matter right. what religion it is. And I've talked to folks in every discipline uh, about how they feel about what you're saying, and most find a way into mm -hmm. it. Yeah. But the, the reality that there is wisdom out there beyond what a scientist like me can offer. And I'd like you, I look at the brain, I see the left hemisphere is pretty good at some types of processing, and the right hemisphere is different, and one is better about things of order, and one's better about things of chaos, yep. you know, I'm making sense of what that just happened, paying attention to things that are unexpected, the other one's pretty good at just automating my life. Yep. And I start to see that much of my behavior is hardwired, more than I would have normally mm -hmm. anticipated or expected. Mm -hmm. And I suspect that when you read some of the, the, this wisdom, I've stopped thinking about people who wrote these beautiful old treatises as, you know, like many scientists think about them as, you know, simpletons who didn't really yeah. understand how the stars and the planets worked and this is their best effort at it. Yeah. They were trying to answer a very different yes, question. Yes, yes, they're not superstitious scientific theories. There's something different. Well, and, that, and the thing about belief, I, I think, I think you, you put your finger on it, is, well, do you follow the story? That's a fundamental religious question. You know, when people go to see a movie like Pinocchio, this is a movie I've taken apart online in some detail. It's like they suspend disbelief. No one thinks that a wooden puppet has become alive. No one questions why the wooden puppet should rescue his father from the chaos of the whale. It all just makes sense. It's like, well, yeah, but why does it make sense exactly? And, and isn't it interesting to notice that it makes sense? And these stories have a pattern, in the, and the pattern has a function, and that's a religious function. You say, well, I don't know whether I believe. It's like, well, you follow the story. The Harry Potter books are a good example of that because they have a deeply, deeply religious substructure. And that's why they were so insanely popular. You know, they have to speak for a book to become that popular. Yeah. It has to speak to something that's in everyone because otherwise, why would they become that popular? You know, and in, in the second volume, Harry confronts the the basilisk, the thing that turns you to stone, that lurks underneath the magic castle. It's like, well, that's life, that's Jaws. It's the same story. It's like, we have a structure. It's kind of magical. We live inside it. It's a hierarchy. But underneath, there's chaos and terror. And that can come up at any time and paralyze you with its gaze, right? Mm -hmm. Turn you to stone because it's so awful. And every building is like that. And so what do you have to do is you have to go down into the depths and confront that thing voluntarily. And then you find, and that's what, that's, you'll find what's of great value in that pursuit and be reborn. It's like, well, that's the Harry Potter story. That's the second volume. It's like, well, everyone knows that story. Do you believe it? Well, do you act it out? That's the, that's the question. Do you act it out? It's the right pattern, I think. And maybe, you know, maybe it's not even the right pattern. Maybe the human race is a hopeless race and there's, and there's no destination for us. But for better or worse, that's our pattern. Our pattern is the snakes are after us. Well, we can cower in our dens. Or we can go out and we can find the source of the snakes. And we can contend with it. And that's what we decided to do. And God only knows how long ago. Millions of years. We decided we weren't going to cower in our dens. We were going to go out and root out the snakes. It's like St. Patrick or St. George. And then we found, well, there was the snakes that will eat you. And then there were the snakes that were in other people's hearts. And then there were the snakes that were in your hearts. And all of those had to be contended with and rooted out. And that's part, of the, that's part of the even deeper mythology. 
is that like there's an association in Christianity between the snake and the garden of evil in Ed of Eden and Satan. It's like, well, where did that come from? What kind of crazy idea is that? Well, I just laid out the idea. It's like, there's always a snake. What's the worst possible snake? Well, it isn't an actual snake. It's a metaphorical snake. It's the snake that's in the heart of your enemy when he comes to burn down your city. Well, what if you get rid of your enemies? Well, the snake's still there. Well, then it's in your heart. So what's the ultimate battle? The ultimate battle is with the snake in your heart. It's like, yes, true, true, metaphorically, but more than that, metaphysically, as true as anything can be, that statement is as true as anything can be. We live in a society where the dividing line between good and evil is between my tribe and someone else's mm -hmm. tribe. Right. And yes. maybe it's inside each and every one of our hearts. Yes, well, that's Solzhenitsyn's comment, right? That's his conclusion from the analysis of the Gulag Archipelago. It's like, constrain the evil within. That's your primary moral obligation. That's why I don't like identity politics. It's like, it's not my tribe and your tribe. Don't be thinking that. That's a mistake. It's more sophisticated than that. You have to understand it as a spiritual battle, not as an economic battle, not as a physical battle. You have to conceptualize it as a spiritual battle. That, that abstracts it, that, term, that puts it up into the level of abstraction where it's properly dealt with, because otherwise it degenerates into tribal violence. Right, so to take that abstract and reduce it to practice, religions are able to provide a grammar. Hmm. Right, science has provided a grammar for some as well, hmm. but religion provides the basic building blocks for a lot of folks. What do you say about the argument that God is dead? Look out for what will replace him. That's the thing. This is why I'm such an admirer of Nietzsche and Dostoevsky, both of them in particular. Because Nietzsche famously announced in the late 1800s that God was dead, but it was also, that wasn't the announcement. The announcement was, God is dead and we have killed him and we'll never find enough water to wash away the blood. And he thought everything would fall because that foundation piece had been ter torn away. And I believe that. So I'm trying to find out, well, what is that foundation piece? See, now Carl Jung, the great psychoanalyst, was a student of Nietzsche. Nietzsche thought that human beings would have to create their own values in the aftermath of the death of God. And there's a utopian idea associated with that, that Dostoevsky, he wouldn't, that wasn't an idea that he would allow. He didn't believe that human beings could do that. Jung, following Freud, discovered that, let's say, that you can't create your own values because you are a certain, you are a certain sort of being. You have a nature. And the best you can do is go down into the depths and rediscover the values. And that's the same as the revivification of God. It's the same thing. It's the rescuing of the father from the belly of the beast. It's the same thing that Pinocchio does. And it's an eternal return to the depths and rec reclamation of, the, the, of a relationship with the divine spirit, let's say. And, and that's, that's religious or metaphysical language, but I mean it most concretely in the sense we already discussed. It's like... Well, that's your ability to contend with potential and turns it, turn it into reality. It's your fundamental responsibility. It's actually what you do as a living, self-conscious being. And we ele elevate that to the highest value, say, that's divine. It's like, yes, that's divine. Well, how is that related to the transcendent divine? I don't know, but it seems related to it. I also think that that's a perfectly reasonable claim. And there's all sorts of experiences that people have under all sorts of different conditions that seem to indicate some relationship between their isolated consciousness and, and being as such. It's outside of our grasp for some reason, but that doesn't mean it's not there. It doesn't mean that people haven't reported on it. So one thing that you've raised to my consciousness is whether we would even have a civilization if we were unable to believe in things bigger than us. So I'm of Turkish origin. Mm -hmm. And I went back to Turkey this summer, in part because I was visiting the Syrian refugees, but within an hour drive of this refugee camp was the oldest civilization known to mankind. It's called Gebekli Tepe. Mm -hmm. The literal translation is Potbelly Hill. It's 12,000 years old, three times older than the pyramids, four times older than Stonehenge. And they had big sculptures. And the reason I was stunned by it is I was always taught in school, I don't know what you learned, but you're in a farming community, you probably had some discussion of how farming came about, but, I, uh, but I, I learned farming happened, and then because of that, we had free time. We sent off a couple of people to be religious leaders. They went off and wrote all the religious tomes, and uh, that's how civilization evolved. Mm. 
But Gebekli Tepe didn't have a agricultural community. It was a hunter-gatherer community, mm -hmm. which meant that hunter-gatherers were able to build right. temples to their gods. Mm -hmm. And because they could believe in things bigger than themselves, they began to think they can control the world around themselves. So follow this, it's important. Yep. Agriculture came because mm -hmm. of a belief in deities, not the opposite. Right. Completely fits everything in my, uh, that I had ever Well, read. if you're a hunter, the question is, what should you hunt? Yeah. See, and we're built on a hunting platform, human beings, because we can throw and aim. So then the question is, once your brain starts to develop, is, okay, what's the ultimate aim? Right? And you might think, well, it's, it's, it's to hunt. It's like, no, it's to provision. Yeah. Okay, so how do you provision? By aiming at transcendent things. Because then everyone cooperates and everyone shares. And we all work together. Mm -hmm. And we get rid of hunger as such instead of aiming at a particular animal, right? We aim at something higher and it works. And so that's encapsulated in our narratives. And then the, the aim issue is really fundamental to that. Like what's at the center? What's the point that we're aiming at? And that's the ultimate point. It's the highest possible aim. It's even in our language. Mm -hmm. And everything we do has to do with aim. It shows you how deeply the idea of hunting is in us. Or carnivorous chimpanzees fundamentally. But you no use the word sin. Hmm? That's right. That sin is to miss your target. Miss your target. Yeah, it's an archery term. Hamartia it means to miss the, miss the mark. Yeah, that's a really useful thing to know. It's like, well, what's a sin? Well, it's when you miss your target. Well, how do you miss your target? How about you don't aim? How about you don't know how to aim? How about you refuse to aim? How about you have no aim? And, and no one can live under those conditions. We need an aim. It orients us. It gives us direction. It, it gives our life meaning. Like literally, it does that neurologically. So that begs the question, without culture, you know, 70,000 years ago, we believe humans started a diaspora mm -hmm. from Northern Africa. At least 12,000 years ago, you have Gebekli Tepe. Abraham, by the way, was born there. Not surprisingly, a lot of Christ's disciples were in that area. I mean, it's, you start to begin to realize that there's lots of layers of culture that got us to where we got. Mm -hmm. And if I'm hearing you correctly, you're saying there's a collective unconscious that senses thousands of years of human evolution, and that culture cannot be discarded. You throw that culture, that faith away, those traditions, even if you're not quite sure why they exist. Okay. You toss them away and you discard them, there will be consequences. Okay, so the first thing is that some of the best scientists that I knew, like Jak Panksepp, who was a great neuroscientist who studied emotion, and I think he was probably one of the five greatest scientists of emotion. He was really interested in, in archetypal ideas. The people who study the emotional and motivational systems in the brain are the ones that are most convinced about the reality of archetypal issues. So, for example... Oh, so, that again. so the people who understand how our brains work specifically... Emotionally and motivate, who look at the emotion and motivational system. So the deep layers, not the cortical right, the tissue. The reptilian part, yeah, old parts. Yeah, that's right, yeah, yeah. They're convinced that these archetypes are vital to us. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, not all of them, but many of them. Explain what an archetype is. An archetype, say... Well, it's a behavioral pattern. That, that's what it would be most fundamentally, a behavioral proclivity. Mm -hmm. And then the secondary archetype would be the reflection of that in a story. So let's say one of our behavioral proclivities is to react in a certain way to a predator. Mm -hmm. So how do we react to a predator? Two ways. Terror, freezing. To be turned to stone when you look at the medusa. That's the response of a prey animal to a predator. That's archetypal, it's mm. wired into us. It happens way before you think, way faster than you can think. But then that's secondarily reflected in a story and that story becomes abstracted. So the ground of the archetype would be the biology. And then the secondary manifestation would be the manifestation of that bi biology in action. And the archetypes are the most important things, I gather, because if they weren't important, we wouldn't be hardwired to react to them. That's right. That's exactly right. So, so it's some of these archetypes aren't r running away from it. They're also respecting your parents. Yes, some right? of them. Not, not, yes, not, well, you better respect your parents or you die. I mean, you ha you're <laughs> dependent on your parents for 18 years. It's like, yeah, there's, there's, filial, there's, there's filial respect built in. Now, it's, it's pliable because sometimes you have parents and if you respect them, you die. So there has to be some plasticity there. Mm. But as a, as a fundamental rule of thumb, it's there as a pattern. And I guess an archetype would also be something like the proclivity to learn language. 
-hmm. No one really understands that, but it's obviously built into us. Even children who are quite impaired intellectually, with the general exception of really severely autistic kids, learn to speak. It's, it's built into our biology in a way that we really don't understand. Fear of snakes is built into our biology. For a long time, psychologists thought it was just, no, we just learned fear. And then psychologists thought, no, we learn to be afraid of some things more easily than others. So you could condition fear to pictures of spiders faster than you could condition fear to pictures of pistols, for example. Mm. But then it went farther than that. It's like, no, no, you're not just conditionable. You're actually innately afraid of snakes. But I don't think it's snakes. I think it's toothed reptilian predators, which is a broader cate category than snakes. So, and that's the dragon fundamentally, because the dragon looks like an amalgam of predatory cats, predatory birds, and predatory snakes, and maybe fire as well, which would have been an ancestral friend and enemy, right? Because fire is an ancestral friend and enemy. There's evidence, I think it was Richard Rangham wrote a very good book on fire a while back, a very good anthrop or primatologist. He figured we'd been using fire for two million years, something like that, and that we traded, um, we traded intestinal tract for brain. Once we learned to cook, and that was a secondary consequence of hunting, let's say, or at least associated with hunting, because our diet became so much more nutritious and calorie rich, especially eating meat and fat, that we could afford to shrink our digestive system and trade it in for brain. Chimps spend about eight hours a day chewing, because mostly what they eat is leaves. It's like, go out and try to eat leaves. It's like, all you're going to do is chew, because they have no nutrition. So anyways, we're built on a hunting platform. We throw an aim. Even our perceptions are are very aimed at something. And the metaphysical question, you see how the biology transforms itself into the abstraction. It's like, well, you have to have an aim because you're a hunter. It's like, well, what's the ultimate aim? That's the religious question. What should you hunt above all else? What should you devote your life to pursuing? So, so why are these stories the best way for us to articulate these negotiated rules that we all have with each other? Because the, because the the principles are so complex that we weren't able to articulate them and understand them. So one of the things Nietzsche pointed out was, you know, you, you tend to think that morality emerges in thought and then is imposed on behavior. We think up the rules and then we apply them. It's like, no, we evolve the rules. Then we observe them in behavior. Mm -hmm. Then we tell stories about them. And then out of the stories, we can abstract general principles. And then maybe we can get to the point of an articulated morality. But it's bottom up. Now, there's top-down effects. Because as you articulate, you start to change your behavior. But a lot of this is moved up from the bottom. One of the things I lecture about in my public appearances is the emergence of proto-morality in animals. So here's a great example. This is from Jak Panksepp, the scientist that I mentioned earlier. He wrote a book called Affective Neuroscience, which is a great book. Um, he said, Here's what he did. Rats like to rough and tumble play. So if you take a juvenile rat, especially the males, they'll work to enter an arena where they can wrestle with another rat. And they really like it. It's play behavior. It's not aggression. It's distinguishable from aggression. OK, so you put your two rats together. One's 10% bigger than the other. The 10% big rat just flattens the little rat, sure. pins them, <laughs> just like kids. Yeah. OK. But then you see, you don't play with someone once. You play with them multiple times in life. So the game isn't one bout. The game is repeated bouts. OK, so now you pair the rats together. So the next time you pair them together, the little rat has to ask the big rat to play. That's the rule. Mm -hmm. Then if you pair them repeatedly, if the big rat doesn't let the little rat win 30% of the time, 30 or 40% of the time, it's some substantial amount of the time, the little rat won't play with them anymore. Huh. And so Panksept is, ha, is right. Yeah. That's for sure. That's a major discovery. Because it's the emergence of it's the emergence of fair play, yeah. it, at the mammalian level. It's like if the if the big rat plays unfair because the little rat doesn't get a chance, then the little rat won't play. So then you think, well, here's the morality, and this is what you say to your kids when you say it doesn't matter whether you win or lose; it matters how it matters how you play the game. You don't know what the hell you mean. It's like, well, what do you mean by that? Yeah, it doesn't, like, matter. doesn't it matter to win. Yeah. Of course, it matters to win. Okay, but let's define winning. There's the game. You can win the game. Okay, but the game isn't isolated because there's a whole bunch of games because it's a tournament. But then it's a tournament of tournaments because it's many games. So what you your wanna, whole life? Your whole life. That's right. Is a sequence of games. So what do you tell your kid? Play so that you will be invited to play, because the winner is the person who's invited to play the most games. And so then, so what does that mean? It means well, 
Try to win because you're no fun if you don't try to win. Sharpen your skills because you're no fun if you don't try. Help your damn teammates because it's a team effort and you want to push them up as you put yourself up. Distribute the spoils. Don't hog all the glory, right? If you're ahead when you're playing soccer, pass the damn ball, right? Act, act in this admirable sportsman-like manner. Well, what's that? It's prototypical morality. So then you think, well, there's, he's a good sport. He does this well. Well, he's a good sport over here too. Here's another person who's a good sport and it's something different. And here's another person. And then we get a picture of what the good sport looks like and that's the good citizen. And we start telling stories about that. But it's not like we understand, right? We can't understand. We have to build the story up from the behavior. And so if you look at these old stories, there's behavioral wisdom encoded in the stories. Here's an idea. Moses leads his people through the desert, right? And they're all fractious. They got out of a tyranny, but now they're in a damn desert. It's like out of the tyranny, out of the, kettle, out of the frying pan into the fire, right? So that's what happens. You go from a tyranny into a desert, not to the promised land, which is why people will stay in a tyranny. It's like, why do you stay in that tyranny? Well, we'd rather be here than in the desert because that's the next place. It's okay, well, now you're in the desert. So what do you do? Fragment and fight over what's important. So that's what Moses faces. It's like all these Israelites, they're fighting like mad. So they come to him, is outlined in the story. So he adjudicates their disputes and he spends like 10,000 hours listening to all the Israelites whine about everybody <laughs> and the desert and complain about God. And so this is driving Moses crazy. He's trying to figure out, well, how should these people live? And he's, he's actually adjudicating the cases. Well, then all of a sudden he goes up in a mountain and poof, the rules appear. It's like, those are the rules by which you live. They're discoveries. It's like, oh, this is, how you have to, this is how you have to conduct yourself behaviorally in order for everyone to prosper. It's bottom up. It, if, he, if he wouldn't have gone out of the tyranny into the desert and done that, all that adjudication, he, the rules wouldn't have been revealed. Or you could say, let's say you're watching a wolf pack or a, trim, a, a, a troop of chimps. They have structure, behavioral structure. So that would be acting out the archetype. You're the anthropologist or the, or the ethologist and you're watching or the primatologist, you think, well, it's as if the chimps are following these rules. Well, that's us. Mm. That's us. We're watching ourselves over thousands of years. It's like, okay, what are we up to? Well, here's an interesting story about how things go badly. It's like, yeah, you're extracting out the essence of the behaviors. And you turn them into a story, and the story's compelling because you want to imitate it, right? Just like a child acting out his father or a child acting out her mother. You want to imitate it so that you get the drama down, you imitate the pattern, but then you can start to think, okay, well, there are principles that can be articulated that underlie these patterns. Oh, that's natural ethics. So it's, it's and this is, this is a wonderful thing because it means that the natural ethic in some sense isn't just a rational construct. It's not just a floating abstraction. It's like the, the articulated ethic matches the image. It matches the story. And the story matches the behavior, and the behavior matches the biology, and the biology reflects the structure of, of being. It's just, that's the musical layering of all these layers, one on top of another. So if we, if we get that it's not just random chance, not just a bunch of rules, but it's actually tens of thousands or maybe even hundreds of thousands of years of us seeing stuff, observing stuff, and our biology matches it. What's going on today? Why do we live in a society I think the biggest epidemic is isolation and loneliness. Yep. But it's manifest in a lot of disagreeable behavior. Mm -hmm. I've heard you use the word complexity management mm -hmm. as opposed to mental illness. Because mm -hmm. a lot of people think I'm depressed, I'm, I'm borderline, I'm you know, personality, I've got this issue, I have that issue. But it's actually, I, if, I, if I understand you correctly, something that's much more common, something much more ubiquitous, something much more understandable, that we have a complexity management problem. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, the the doctrine of turning to face that which confronts you is a complexity management solution. It's like, what do you do when horrible things are chasing you? Turn around, chase them back. That's your best bet. And then I think that is an unbelievably ancient human decision. Well, so that's the story of, that, that's the classic story of the dragon fight. You go out, the, the hero goes out to confront the dragon and rescues the virgin from her clutches. Well, what does that mean? It means that the standard human pattern of sexual attraction is for the person who decides to confront the predator in its lair to be reproductively successful. That's what that story means. 
It's like, well, that's worked for us. That's our fundamental story. And who knows how old that is? It's as old as, it's as, old as predator primates. That's how old it is. Maybe it's older than that. So that's at least several million years old. Hmm. But it goes back. It's like Lynn Isbell, who's, a, who's a, an anthropologist at UCLA, she makes the case that the reason that human beings have acute vision is because we were preyed upon by predatory snakes over a 60 million year period. Hmm. So we have unbelievably acute vision. And we're particularly good at seeing the kind of um, camouflage patterns that snakes have on their skin in the lower half of our visual system. It's like snakes gave people vision. That's Lynn Isbell's theory. And the way she established that was she went around the world and she looked at the acuity of primate vision and correlated it with the prevalence of predatory serpents. So the more snakes, the better our vision. The more, exactly. Right. So that, and that's such a cool principle too because there's a metaphysical principle there too, which is, you know, why, why does reality have an adversarial nature? Why would God set something on you, say, an enemy? An adversary makes you stronger. Well, isn't that cruel? It's like not if the person who sets the adversary on you believes that you could win. Now, maybe that's an insufficient explanation, but there's something about it that's... You know, you can think about this biologically, too. I was reading The Master and His Emissary, which is quite an interesting book about hemispheric function, and, and uh, the author pointed out that if you want to make a very small movement with your right hand, the best way to do that is to put your left hand up and then to push against your right hand and push. Opponent processing. Precision in action is a consequence of opponent processing. You have opponent processing between the right and left hemispheres. Mm. To, to, to make things function, you need this, this opposition between powerful forces. And I think that's built into the opposition between chaos and order. That's hemispherically represented. But also something like the opposition between good and evil. Maybe you get a higher good when there's a opposition between good and evil. I mean, obviously, these are ideas that are at the absolute extent of my cognitive ability to try to think them through, but maybe the good you get when good and evil are both possibilities is a higher good than the good you get with just good. That tug of war, which you actually are, are your artists do brilliantly, right? They, they stand on the border between order and chaos, they look in the chaos, mm -hmm. they see patterns, and then they tell the people on the other side, hey, I just noticed a couple yeah. things over there, yeah. right? So, so if, if that's where we need to be, that in modern society, why is it that we can't get those two groups talking to each other? People who are primarily left brain, you know, or, organized order folks and the, the folks on the right side are more mm. chaos folks. What good, gives? Good, good, good question. Well, that's, a, that's, that's something I've really been struggling with in my lectures. I, I try to make a case for left, the left <laughs> and the right wing. Okay, so the right wing, the right wing, there's a variety of things that distinguish them, but we'll talk about one in particular. You have to accomplish useful things in the world just to survive, okay? And if you're going to do that in a social space, you do that by constructing a hierarchy. And if you construct a hierarchy, it's going to be of a certain steepness because the people at the top are going to be more successful than the people at the bottom. There are, there's also hierarchies of productivity, so the people at the top are more productive than the people at the bottom. And those overlap to some degree. So you have to do useful things to survive. If you're going to do useful things in a social system, you have to build a hierarchy. Okay, so hierarchies are necessary and valuable. That's what the right says. The left says, yeah, wait a minute though, the hierarchy tends towards ossification and corruption and it dispossesses people at the bottom. <coughs> sorry. Sorry. California fires. <coughs> sorry, go ahead. No problem. Well, and those are both true. And that's part of that opponent processing. You need the hierarchy. Social animals organize themselves hierarchically. Hierarchies are way older than capitalism, way older than the West. They're older than trees. They're unbelievably ancient. There's no getting rid of the hierarchy. But hierarchies tend towards corruption and dispossession. And those so, are tied, by the way, with the lobster. Yes, exactly. Yes, yeah, someone, someone gave years. me this. Yeah, exactly. 350 million years of hierarchies. Now, that doesn't mean we should organize our societies on the lines of the lobsters. That's not <laughs> the point. The point is, is that you can't attribute the existence of hierarchy to the West or to capitalism. So that's a, that's a foolish critique. That's the basic Marxist critique, is at least part of it. Okay, so the left wing says, wait a second now. The hierarchies tend towards corruption, and they dispossess people, and they need to be taken care of. It's like, yes. How much should we take care of them versus how much should we sustain the hierarchy? And the answer is, we don't know, and it changes. 
So that's why you need political dialogue. Okay, so what's the fundamental necessity for political dialogue? Freedom of speech. So freedom of speech is the mechanism that keeps the opponent process balanced. And so you don't mess with freedom of speech, which is why I opposed the legislation that I opposed in Canada, which started all this political... The transgender legislation. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Just for two seconds on this. Yeah. So there was a, a law that said you must refer to transgender people the way they, 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 they want you to, right? Picking the pronoun they use. Yes, that was part of the legislation, background part of the legislation. And, and you have, do you have any problems with transgender people being identified by what pronoun they use? in private settings in your practice or in your, in your classrooms? My proclivity when people ask me to address them in a certain way is that if I believe that they're being straightforward in their communication, then I tend to accede to the demand, like a reasonable person does. So that wasn't the issue. The issue was the compulsion of speech and also the government's insistence that it was all right to build a social constructionist view of gender into the law, which is now the case in, well, it's the case in New York. It's also the case in Canada. And that's not appropriate because gender is not socially constructed in its entirety. It has a biological basis. So you don't build that into the law. So, but anyways, that it was the compelled speech issue that really got me. It's like, no, you don't have sovereign control over my speech. Never in the history of English common law has, a, has, a, ha, has the legislative branch produced legislation that compelled voluntary speech. There has been restrictions on hate speech. There's more of those in Canada than there are in the US. And I don't agree with them either. I think that's a mistake, but that's a separate issue. Compulsion in speech, your Supreme Court deemed that invalid in 1942. No compulsion of speech in the private sphere, no matter what the reason. And I think that's the correct principle. And what's, so, and, the, what's, and what's the issue with hate speech? Well, hate speech exists, clearly. The question is, it's the fundamental issue. Who defines hate? And that's like the Achilles tendon of the, the Achilles heel of the, of the law. It's like, the answer is those people who you least want to define it. So you, what you want is you want to have people say their hateful things out in the open where you can keep an eye on them and where they can invalidate their own viewpoint, which is generally what happens. Invalidate so, their viewpoint. Yes. So they say something hateful, racist, for example, the society says, you guys, you're missing the boat. This, you're completely off target yeah, with this. Right. You get reprimanded, spanked, yeah. you get back in line. Right, exactly, exactly that. That's how it's supposed to work. Yeah, well, that's, and that's a good way of putting it because what it also means is that the people who espouse those opinions for whatever reason get appropriately subjected to social correction. And that's good. You want them to be subjected to social correction. So what happens if the government passes a law saying you can't say those words? Then where do they go? Underground. And psychologically and socially, and that's not good, because then you don't know what's going on. Like this thing that happened with Alex Jones is a good example of that. It's like, leave Alex Jones alone. Why? Because you, you want to see what he's up to. You not want to know. Not, not because you like him, but you want to see what he's up to. Yeah, absolutely. You want to see what people are up to. You know, because sometimes extremists are correct. Almost never. They're almost always dangerous beyond belief, but like one time in a thousand, things have changed so radically that someone who appears extreme is correct. Well, you've got to be able to know when that's the case. You've got to keep an eye on it. You know, and it's not clear to me at all that the, most of the followers of Alex Jones necessarily agree with him. Maybe they're mildly entertained by his antics, wh whatever it might be, but it was a mistake to go after him. So you've got to keep an eye on it. Plus, you shouldn't persecute people who are paranoid. <laughs> That was uh, Kissinger's big statement to Nixon mm -hmm. you know, about Nixon. Even paranoid people have enemies. Right, right, right. <laughs> now you right. can confirm their bias. Right, that's exactly right. Yes, that's not a good idea. Why is every person watching us right now, and there are quite a few, suffering from anxiety, depression, addiction, all three together mm -hmm. even? How, how is it possible we're not all there in that quandary? Oh, well, first of all, many people are at different periods in their life. Right? It's a rare person who doesn't have a severe bout of anxiety at some point in their life, often because things collapse around them, you know, like they, they encounter some real catastrophe. Even with depression, if you look at the epidemiological studies, most people who eventually suffer depression had their first episode precipitated by something truly awful. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we move in and out of states of terrible negative emotion throughout our life. Um, why, don't we, why don't we stay there? What makes us better? Almost subconsciously, we have a resilience. Yeah, well, some of it, some of it's 
the grace of God in blind luck. You know, some people are just healthier than other people and that makes a big difference. So, you know, you don't want to be too morally self-righteous about the absence of anxiety in your life. It, it could easily be due to your characterological strengths and your willingness to confront things voluntarily and all that, but health plays a big role. Um, health and good fortune, you know, I mean, you meet people now and then who are in their 40s and they've never suffered a serious loss from death, for example. Do you think part of the reason that people find their path is because they know the story they're in? Oh, definitely. And, and some folks, they don't know what story they're in, or they're in someone else's story as a bit player, as you've, yeah, yeah. As you've articulated. Yeah, well, we've produced some things, some exercises online to help people get their story straight. There's one exercise called future authoring. That Sp yeah, speak people. about that. I did that, actually. Yeah. Yeah, well, you know, the idea was that it's, it, it's based on exactly the questions you asked, which is, well, what's the story of your life? Is it a comedy or a tragedy? Comedy is something with a happy ending, fundamentally, and a tragedy is, well, it starts bad and gets worse. <laughs> you know, and is it a tragedy that someone else is imposing on you or some bit, bit of you that you don't understand? What's the story of your life? Part of that is, well, what do you want? What are you aiming at? That's the reverse of sin, right? right? You're aiming at something. Well, the future authoring program helps you determine what it is that would be good for you to aim at. What do you hope for? What do you hope for? When, and if you, so the exercise basically assumes that you treat yourself as if you're someone that you're taking care of. Mm -hmm. So that's the presupposition. You're valuable despite your flaws. It would be okay for you and maybe all right for the universe as a whole if your life wasn't any less, any more wretched than it has to be. So we could set it up for that. Right. Okay, so, so now if you were looking three to five years down into the future and you could, you could have what you needed within the bounds of reason, what would it be? What do you want? What do you want from your family? What do you want from your friends? How are you going to educate yourself? What are you going to do for your career? How are you going to take care of your mental and physical health? How are you going to resist temptation? What are you going to do with your time outside of work that's productive and meaningful? You get to have it. It's like knock and the door will open. Okay, you've got to knock first. Well, and then you've got to pick the door. And like, oh, I really like this because it is, you cannot catch something you're not pursuing. So now, if you're pursuing it, that doesn't mean you'll catch it. But generally, you'll catch something interesting along the way. Yeah. You know, that's the, that's the thing that's so cool about this. Let's say you set out a vision, you start pursuing it, you don't get what you were after. But you learn a lot as you move towards that destination. And as you learn, your vision is going to change and you may end up with something that's better than what you were aiming at to begin with. But that won't happen unless you initiate the journey. That's partly something I learned from, from the Abrahamic stories, with the story of Abraham in particular, because God calls Abraham to an adventure when he's like 85. It's like, get out of your father's tent, for God's sake. Get out there in the world, right? And really, that's how the story is set up. Leave your family and your tent. It's time to get out in the world. Well, what does he confront? Famine is the first thing, tyranny, and the potential loss of his wife. Yeah. It's like Abraham must have been going. <laughs> it's like the tent was lo tents looking pretty good. <laughs> but it's this call to adventure. Okay, so you put together a vision. That's your call to adventure. Get out there in the world and p contend with it. Well, you might not get what you want, but you might find what you need. But it won't happen without the pursuit. And that's part of faith, right? Faith is, I'm going out in the world to seek my fortune. And if I do that properly, then the fates will cooperate with me. How, how do the archetypal stories that we in our subconscious have? These are these, these the, I mean, archetypal questions are the ones that everyone really is trying to ask, yeah. even if we can't put words to it right. How, how do they help us maintain our sanity? And do you think that's part of what we're struggling with right now, that we've, mm -hmm. we, we've lost touch with ancient wisdom, again, mm -hmm. part of our collective unconscious, that should be there, should be part of us, that we've distanced ourselves from, either from technology or modern culture, whatever. Yeah. Well, look, we have the capacity for abstraction, right? And so to abstract means you can think without acting, because mm -hmm. otherwise it's useless. It's not abstraction then. Yeah. So you can, you can peel reality away and represent it abstractly, and then you can start manipulating it. And you can criticize what you're representing. And we're doing an awful lot of that. A lot of that's subsidized, I would say, this intense criticism of our own structure. It's like, fair enough, you know? Yeah. But you don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater, so to speak, especially if it's the divine child that you're throwing out, which is what it is. It's like, criticism, this is where the, the left goes too far when it's criticizing. It's like, well, 
You can criticize the hierarchy. You can criticize the current instantiation of the hierarchy. It isn't obvious that you can criticize the idea of hierarchy itself. You're pushing a little too far then. You can describe the tyrannical nature, the partial tyrannical nature of the current societal structure. You can't say all hierarchies are patriarchal tyrannies. That's too far. You have to use some judgment. And so the, the proclivity for, and the thing is, what are you trying to do when you criticize? Well, if you're smart, like when I get my students to read Freud, it's like, or Nietzsche. Well, these guys had, A, they were bound, bound by their time and place, and so they had presumptions that we no longer share, and B, they said things that were regrettable. Nietzsche said a variety of things about women that were regrettable, um, partly, I think, because he, he didn't have that much success on the romantic front, partly because he was very ill, partly because he was isolated. Like, he had his reasons, but it's not that helpful. Maybe you read Nietzsche, it's like you get rid of 10% of it, but you keep the rest. You read Freud, it's the same thing. You read these people who were flawed humans and you think, well, let's separate the wheat from the chaff. We're not going to put it all in a pile and burn it. It's like, oh, Freud made a mistake. Burn him. That's what we're doing with people on social media. It's like, no, discriminate. There's a horrible word for people. Yeah. Don't discriminate. It's like, yeah, discriminate, man. Like your life depended on it. You read these old thinkers and you think, well, no, no, yes. That goes in the keep pile. That goes in the keep pile. We're not doing that with our culture. And it's partly because we don't have any gratitude, as far as I can tell. And this is another thing I talk to my audiences about. Here's the story. Here's how to, here's how to survive in Indonesia. Okay. So you live on a mountain, but it's a volcano. <laughs> All right. So you get to climb up the volcano at night. It has to be at night because it's too hot otherwise. And so you have to climb up this volcano. And it's a mountain. Then you have to go inside the volcano, down to near where the volcano is active, because it's active. So it's belt belching out sulfuric clouds at you all the time. And if you encounter a bad one, then you just die. So when you have a mask around your face that's just a wet rag, and you go down to the volcano, and you pick up a 40-pound clump of sulfur, and then you carry it up out of the volcano at night, because otherwise it's too hot, and then you carry it down the mountain, and you get a couple of dollars so that you can do it again. Yeah. That's not your life, but someone has that life. And you don't have that life because look around you, man. This is a remarkable place that we've built. It's absolutely unbelievable. And most of the time it works and you should be on your knees in gratitude for it. Even though you can also say, well, look, we don't have full equality of opportunity. We're not making the use of full use of the talents that everybody's bringing to the table. The system tilts towards tyranny from time to time and we have to keep an eye on it. It's like, yeah, but you're not hauling 40 pound sulfur boulders out of volcanoes at night. That's something, you know? So a little gratitude would, 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 would temper the, the criticism. You've made the point that part of the reason people get bitter <clears throat> is because they don't think they can be as good as they should be able to be. And a lot of it comes back to self-esteem. How do we build self-esteem at any age? Because I see that slip away in a lot of people, and without that, they don't have the confidence to act on some of the things you're speaking to. Okay, so self-esteem is a tricky concept because the best predictor of self-esteem is trait neuroticism. So the higher you are in trait neuroticism, Please explain one of the, that for everybody. There are, there are five cardinal personality traits, extroversion, neuroticism, agreeableness, conscientiousness, and openness. I have a test that people can take, understand myself, that allows them to assess those five traits broken down into two additional aspects. I took mine, by the way. My results were scary. Yeah, well, the, the test is designed so that everybody's results get to be scary. It's scary to find out who you are. Right. So, but how the trait neuroticism is a measure of the proclivity for negative emotion, anxiety and emotional pain, essentially. And the higher you are in that, the lower you score on tests of self-esteem. So self-esteem is not a very good measurement because basically it's a misnamed reverse neuroticism. So it's not easy to deal with that proclivity for anxiety. But th there's a separate question, which is more like how do you encourage people? Right. That's, and so it's not a matter of bolstering their self-esteem. It's actually, it's really important to get these things right because if you don't get the conceptions right, then the implementations fail. So it's about reducing neuroticism? Well, if you could, I don't think you can, What really. What you can do is make people more courageous. 
That's different. So even if you're treating people who are phobic, like agoraphobic, it isn't obvious that you make them less phobic. What is obvious is that you make them more courageous. So if you're treating someone who's agoraphobic and they, they, they won't go on an elevator, so they're afraid of an elevator, and you slowly expose them to the elevator, negotiating that, and they, they get to the point where they can get on the elevator, they don't really, they're not really less afraid of death than they were. They're more confident of their ability to prevail in the face of adversity. And that, you can teach that. And you do that by challenge. You do that through challenge. So if you want to build someone's self-esteem, let's say, but I would say encourage them, then set them a set of optimal challenges and allow them to watch themselves succeed at those challenges and that will build it right into their bones. All right, so let's go back to this lobster story since you're wearing the lobster yeah. tie, all right? So 350 million years ago, you had a hierarchy. There's, yeah. there's hierarchies in most everything, it seems. Some lobsters win the hierarchy. They yeah. get to have all the female lobsters, I yeah. guess. What, what do you do with the lobsters at the bottom of the hierarchy? Now, today you say we've got to talk about them. Can't ignore them. Yeah. But it's not easy just to engineer society to automatically manifest a better life. Although I think a lot of people say we can do better than we are for a lot of people. Don't seem yeah. to really get a, they don't get a chance. Yeah. But what is the, the beta lobster... How do they get courageous? Well, I think we do a lot of, I think we have done a lot of things successfully in our society. So the first is, is that it's not a monolithic hierarchy by any stretch of the imagination. As we've made society more complex, the number of sub-hierarchies have multiplied tremendously. And so, each, let's say each of us comes to the table with a different set of weaknesses and strengths, is it's highly probable that you'll be able to find a sub-hierarchy where your particular pattern of weaknesses and strengths actually constitutes the crucial element. Mm -hmm. So if you're high in agreeableness, for example, well, healthcare is a good field for you. And if yeah. you're really conscientious, then you can be a manager. And if you're open, then you can be entrepreneurial or creative. So play in a different hierarchy. Find the hierarchy that matches your temperament. That's a really good rule. And then we could say, well, let's diversify the hierarchies. And we are doing that and, and at a very rapid rate. I mean, God, there's an endless number of diverse hierarchies on, online, for example. So you, 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 a, a, a sophisticated society produces a subset of hierarchy that's matched for as many people as possible. Okay, but then there's additional complications and some of them we don't know how to deal with. So for example, one of the things that predicts um, the ability to succeed in hierarchies across hierarchies seems to be as associated with intelligence. So all things considered, across most hierarchies, it's better to be intelligent. So then the question is, well, what do you do with, with people who are of less cognitive power? And that's an increasingly complex problem. So, and I don't think we have a straightforward solution to that because one of the dangers is, is that as our society becomes more technological and more cognitively complex, the effect of intelligence actually grows and that's what the literature So what do you do with, with members of our society who cannot compete? Well, because we have an obligation. That was one of the basic one of the basic insights I gained from reading and listening to you was that we all have that spark of divinity. Yeah. That you can't leave. When Nietzsche said God is dead, because science had prospered, but it only happened because religion first respected our specialness. Yeah. Each of us. Yeah. And only after that can yeah. we begin to transcend it. Okay. Well, this is the way I the way I look at this is that. Let's say that you're blessed with success, like you've been blessed with success. Okay, so you have a lot of resources at your disposal. Okay, now you could feel guilty about that, and perhaps to some degree that you should. That's yeah. between you and your conscience. But let's say that you've generated your resources in a fair game, mm -hmm. and that a lot of people have benefited along with you. So you've played a straight game. Now you have all these resources. Okay, so what should you do with the resources? Well, impulsive pleasure. It's like, well, little of that goes a long ways, and it's liable to take you down in a very, very yeah. short period of time. Yeah. Okay, I've so done many shows on that. So right. Okay, so how about <laughs> not that? Doesn't work. Right. It's <laughs> not a good medium to long term solution. Okay, how about your ethical responsibility grows in proportion to the resources that you have at your control? And the right thing to do is that as you become more competent, authoritative, and able, is to expand the range in which you're operating to do more good. It's like you got a problem, you see some, some something in the world that's bothering you, you think, well, that's a problem, it's bothering me. Because that's an interesting thing, not everyone bothers everything. Some things bother each of us. That's your problem, whatever bothers you. It's like, that's like a little marker 
I don't know why it emerges. That's your problem. You should go out there and do something about that. Okay, so you have some excess resources. It's like, great, get at it. And this is one of the things I like about someone like Bill Gates, for example. It's like, what's he doing? Well, how about combating malaria? Yeah. Okay, <laughs> you got $60 billion, you wanna wipe out malaria? That's, it might be a good thing that you have $60 billion if one of the consequences is that you're gonna wipe out malaria, or at least you're gonna try. And he's after the five major diseases, right? right? And actually, from what I've been able to read, is like making some headway. It's like, great. So, so what is winning, losing, what is success? How does that all fit into this hierarchy game? It's it, musical. Musical. Sure. It's Multiple like, layers. You bet. It's like, you know, maybe it's a Strauss waltz, eh? It's beautiful. And you're dancing with someone you love. And the orchestra is being conducted and everyone's dancing around you and everything is stacked up harmoniously. It's like you're winning at every level simultaneously. And that's where the maximal meaning is. It's like the, there isn't anything better than that. Why would you pursue anything else? You want to win at every level. And that means that not only do you win, but the, the, the fact of your winning is related integrally to the fact of everyone else's winning. That's a perfect game. It's like, not only are you winning, so is everyone that's playing with you. It's like, great. And that is, and I do believe, I, I believe we're, we're wired for that to be a meaningful experience. God, look at, look at, look at us. You go to a sports game and you see a remarkable display of a athletic prowess and sportsmanship at the same time. Everybody spontaneously gets up and applauds. Before they think, it's like, yes, you got it. I see that picture, but I also see pictures often on the set of men and women coming in, not getting each other. Yep. And a lot of times it's, it's hard to understand what the guy's up to. Something just, because you know, I think we're all, as, as humans, like Maseratis. Mm -hmm. I mean, as a surgeon, I see the inner workings of this. When one little spark plugs off, everyone can hear it. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you can't hear it over the noise, but it's there. Mm -hmm. So when, when, when a woman is not happy, for example, with how, uh, what, what she needs out of life. Yeah. Most divorces these days in middle-aged couples are initiated by the women. Yeah. How That's a consequence that? of higher trait neuroticism in all likelihood. Explain. Well, women are higher in trait neuroticism than men. And I think it's because they have to take care of infants. And so they're, I don't think women's, adult women's nervous systems are attuned to the needs of women. I think they're attuned to the needs of woman and infant. That's different. Mother and infant. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Mother and, and young infant too. And so there's more sensitivity to threat than might be good for a woman's mental health across the span of her individual life. But it's the price she pays for being hypervigilant for her infants. And it's driving the sorts of things that we know that one of the predictors of divorce, for example, is high trait neuroticism in at least one of the partners. So because how, they're more unhappy. So how does an unhappy woman express that in a successful way to get the guy to change? Because he doesn't have trait neuroticism, right? Yeah. He's not all worried about being a father of a young child. Yeah. That's not how he's, he's hardwired for aiming at the target. Yeah. Well, it might be worth having a discussion about what target to aim at. You know, again, that's why we developed the future authoring program. It's like, okay, what are you both up to? What are you aiming at? We need to, we need to establish that. And you say, well, I'm not aiming at anything. It's like, yes, you are. If you don't know what you're aiming for, that just means you don't know what you're aiming for. You can't live without an aim. It also might mean that you're aiming at 25 things at the same time, so you're polytheistic in some sense, and 10 of those aims are working at cross purposes to the other 10. So you're a house divided amongst itself. See, I think a lot of times women are bit players in their family story, hmm. and they figure it out. Hmm. And that's not fulfilling. Hmm. You want to be the main character, protagonist yeah. of your story. Well, that's also perhaps associated with higher trade agreeableness. It's another big five trait. So if you're agreeable, you tend to defer to others and you're compassionate. Now, deferring to others isn't necessarily a virtue. We tend to think of compassion as a virtue, but we already discussed that. It's like, well, one of the things that you do if you're a clinician, like clinicians basically do two things. They help people deal with anxiety and negative emotion. That's a big part of it. Mm -hmm. And the other is they do assertiveness training. And that's usually for people who are too high in agreeableness. It's like, okay, what do you want? I've had clients who were so agreeable, they couldn't say what they wanted. It's like, what do you want? I don't know. They, they've been so other-centered that they don't, they don't know what it is that, that they're crying out for. And that's often a very lengthy process of discovery. But then you have to, you have to find out what you want. Then you have to figure out how to fight for it because you don't just get what you want. It's like, 
All right, so that isn't how things work. That, this is, you know, since you're talking <clears> about fighting for what you want, this came up in your uh, Channel 4 interview in the, uh, in the UK mm -hmm. about uh, the fundamental difference between women and men. And a hot topic that, that we've talked about on the show is the fact that women aren't paid in a, in a way that it seems equitable to the men mm -hmm. in a similar job. Mm -hmm. And you made arguments that there are fundamental differences between men and women where women need to play some of the role, and assertiveness is mm -hmm. part of it. Yeah, well, this. agreeable people get paid less for the same job than disagreeable people. Because they don't ask? Sure. Look, if you do your job very competently, you might expect that your boss should notice that, and probably he or she should. But the problem with doing things well is that it's invisible. What's visible is mistakes. So then you just work really hard and you're invisible. It's like, well, you're invisible. That's not helpful. And they're like, did you ask? And maybe asking isn't good enough. Like, I've counseled lots of people who've tripled their salaries in two or three years. Like, it's work, man. It's work. It's a strategy. It's a war to do that. But you can do it. I mean, the first thing you do is, well, the first thing we do is, well, are you actually doing a good job? Let's say yes. Okay, fine. Are you documenting it? Generally, no. Yes. If you're documenting, are you communicating the documentation? Well, no. Okay, is your CV up to date and prepared? Are you ready to move laterally? Are you looking for other positions? Are you looking for other opportunities within the workplace? How often do you talk to your boss about what you're doing? What are your salary goals? Well, I want a 15% raise. Did you ask? No. Well, <laughs> sorry, man, you're not gonna get it if you don't ask, unless you're assuming that your boss is omniscient and benevolent, which is highly improbable, especially if you're doing a good job and you can be ignored. You know, and then it's not only, it's not only a matter of asking, it's a matter of negotiating. Because if I want something from you and it's somewhat of a zero-sum game, and often the distributable pile of money is somewhat of a zero-sum game, it's like, here's six reasons why you should pay me 15% more, and here's two things that aren't good that will happen if you don't. Hmm. So, and then usually you're not even negotiating with your boss, you're negotiating with your boss's boss. So what you're trying to do is to give your boss a story so that he can or she can go to the next person up and say, well, we have to give this person 15% more because if we don't, first they're doing a good job and here's the documentation which they so helpfully supplied me for and here's the negative costly thing that will happen if we don't. It's like, oh yeah, give them their money because it's cheaper than hiring someone else. It's like you have to think strategically and you have to be disagreeable. And the disagreeable part is you have to negotiate on your own behalf. You what's, know, the, what's, so, what's the fundamental difference between men and women? Well, the, the temperamental traits are women are higher in trait neuroticism, so they feel more negative emotion, anxiety, and emotional pain pr primarily, mm -hmm. and they're higher in agreeableness, which is compassion, compassion and politeness. Right. And that's, that's about half a standard deviation, which isn't a lot, so men and women are more the same than they are different by a substantial margin, mm -hmm. but at the extremes, those, those differences really make a difference. So... For example, women's higher trait neuroticism, negative emotionality, is reflected in the fact that cross-culturally they're more likely to be diagnosed with depression and anxiety disorders. Whereas men's disagreeableness is reflected in the fact that they're more likely to be arrested and imprisoned. So it's 10 to 1 male convicts to female. You think that's a matter of socialization? You think this court system is stacked against men? We're going to have an equity program for men and women in prison? Or are we going to accept the fact that men tend to be more violent than women? Which is also, by the way, women commit, women attempt suicide more often than men. That's a reflection of their higher levels of anxiety and depression. But men commit suicide more often because they use lethal means, yes, and that's a reflection of their lower levels of agreeableness and their proclivity towards physical aggression. So, and you think, well, that's all sociologically constructed. No. The data are in. So, you rank order countries by how egalitarian their social policies are. And you put the Scandinavian countries at the top because they have the most egalitarian social policies. If we know what egalitarian means, you know, if it's not the Scandinavians, then we don't know what egalitarian means because that's what they've been trying to do. Then you look at personality differences across those countries. If it's sociological, then the, the smallest personality differences are in Scandinavia because they've been obliterated by the egalitarian policies. Mm -hmm. That's exactly the opposite of what happened. The biggest personality differences in the world are between Scandinavian men and women. Why? Because when you take out the sociological variability, 
you maximize the biological variability. Right, it's exactly the opposite of what virtually everyone predicted. No one, no one saw that coming, but that's what happened. And it's not like a few little studies done by some right-wing professors of psychology in some little podunk institution. First of all, there are no right-wing professors of psychology. So no one's been happy about this. Second, these are studies with thousands of people. Like they're, the, they're among the most credible psychological studies that have ever been done. And it's not only personality, it's interest. This is the big one. The biggest difference between men and women in the Scandinavian countries isn't trait neuroticism or agreeableness, those are personality dimensions, the biggest difference is in interest. And women tilt towards people and men tilt towards things. It also turns out that if you're in a thing oriented job you tend to make more money because they're scalable. You know, it's like how many people can you take care of? So a thing is you're building machines, cars, gadgets, gadgets, yeah, and tools. Pe people you're helping people, hospitals, right. psychology. Yeah, exactly, exactly, and that tends to be more one-on-one. -on -one. It's hard to scale healthcare, and you don't make a lot of money in most enterprises that aren't scalable. So taking a step back from this, should we be following our bliss? That's the message that we've been putting out there a lot, and I, you, there's a comment, and I've heard it. Uh, from others as well, that we were better off following our blisters than our bliss. Yeah, yeah, right? yeah, yeah. Uh, is, is, is that an important part of your message? That the promise of bliss is, is a false promise? Yeah, it's not the right term, and you've got to get your terms right. Precision in speech, right? Speech matters, because that's how you turn potential into reality, mm -hmm. right? Meaning. If you pursue what's meaningful, then sometimes you'll encounter bliss. Perhaps as often as it's possible to. Mm -hmm. which I would say isn't that often. Those are sort of peak experiences, meaning. And I do believe that meaning is a fundamental instinct. In fact, I think it's the most fundamental instinct. It's what you've got. Meaning is real. It might be the most real thing. I, I pick on that theme because it's, it's an example of how people aren't getting you because the, uh, amongst the critics. And another example, because you know, people say, well, follow my bliss. I want to be happy. I want to be yeah. light. I want to be... You know, it's like the bubbly, yeah. uh, sparkling water you, in my how tongue. How about you want to be good? That'd be way better. Pursue what makes you good, as opposed to evil. Bliss? Sorry, no. And what about the issue of, of political correctness, much of which I think came about because a lot of my generation grew up when reprehensible things could easily be stated hmm. about women in the workplace, about folks of different gender, color, you know, that was... Vietnam War. The Vietnamese War. Yes, you know. which really tore the country apart. I, 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 I think a lot of my generation has PTSD just watching the news at age five mm -hmm. and wondering why everyone thought that everyone was lying, and it mm -hmm. still has impacted us. But there are groups that have a sensitivity to how they are portrayed, mm -hmm. and political correctness allows you to be polite, if nothing else, good at, at, at a higher level, and yet... You've criticized political correctness. I gather because you think you'd, it chases people. It's a wrong narrative. It's a group-oriented narrative. It's like, the, so people have social groups, obviously, and they're individuals. <coughs> and the question is, group first, individual second, or individual first, group second? And the answer is, individual first, group second, or else. And the politically correct types who play identity politics say, no, your fundamental characteristic is your group. Now, there's all sorts of problems with that. It's like, well, the first problem, and this is the intersectional people within the politically correct camp have already realized this. Well, which group? Oh, it turns out that people belong to like five groups. Okay, so do you make all of their groups the number one thing? Well, that doesn't work because there's an infinite number of groups. So that just can't work. Actually, you see, what the West discovered was that you have to fractionate the groups to get justice. Where do you stop fractionating them? In individual. <laughs> that's right. That's exactly well, right. Well, I, mean, I, I, I yeah, get that there are emotional exactly hemophiliacs that. out yeah. there yeah. where, you know, there's a lot of sense, sensitivity that you may not be able to control as a, as a speaker. And you're not going to please everybody. I get it. But for me, a lot of the speech that we would call politically correct is polite speech. It's, I'm giving you There's a break because I don't want to no be mean problem, to you. No problem with polite speech. It depends on how it's enforced and who's enforcing it. That's the thing. It's like, you want to be polite? No problem. First of all, you should reserve the right to be impolite when necessary. Because otherwise you're, you've, been, you've been deprived of your defenses. Mm -hmm. And that's not good. So 
it's not, for example, it's not like I don't believe there's hate speech. There is. The question is, how mm. should it be relate, regulated? I, it's not like I don't believe that there's prejudice. There is. That's not the issue. The issue is, how do you conceptualize the world? Or that's, and the identity politics types, they have a fundamental tribal conception. They try to make group identity the fundamental issue. They assume that the best narrative is oppressor versus oppressed, and they play up the victim issue, and I don't think that's good for anyone. I think all it does is divide, divide society I, and return us to a, to a fractionated tribal existence. It's the wrong, the whole story is wrong. That's the problem with political correctness. It's like you put the group first. No, no, wrong. The thing that we got right in the West is that we put the individual first. And I, I'm not willing to see that eroded. It's a mistake. And it's not because of rights. It's because of responsibility. So the way out of the oppressive structure of history is through maximal adoption of individual responsibility. It's the best way forward. So Let's talk about how we pass that along, the, 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 the best that we are, along to the next generation. Yeah. Uh, th there's a line that you've offered that really caught me off guard. There are many, but this one was pr particularly provocative. You said, don't give your children a reason for you to hate them. Hmm, right, right. That's rule five, right? Don't let your children do anything that makes you dislike them. Yeah, well, that's another... Most of the book, 12 Rules for Life, is about responsibility and meaning. I would say those are the two. Responsibility, meaning, and truth. That's probably the interplay of the, mm. of the principles. Well, the question is, what are you doing if you're a parent? And the answer is, preparing your child to be maximally socially welcome. That's your job. And it's the job of the two of you. Because the two of you together make one reasonable person. Okay, so now you're a reasonable person because you've kind of ironed out your idiocies with each other, right. right? Through that opponent process, that, that contentious relationship, that wrestling that's part of a real relationship. You're both smarter and wiser than you would have been otherwise. You, and that's part of the reason for the vow, eh? It's like, I'm not leaving you. Oh my God, you mean we're stuck with each other? It's yes, for how long? Six decades. Oh, so this stupid problem we have isn't going to go away for six decades? It's like, well, we... <laughs> right. No kidding. We better do something about it. So there's going to be contention there. So let's say we fix each other up so we're kind of 80% functional as a unit. Okay, now we have a child. The child has this 80% functional unit. And to the degree that the child can establish a relationship with that unit, that will generalize to other people. And so you want your child to be a good play partner for other children because by the time he or she is four, their primary source of socialization will be other children. So if they're not prepared to take their place in the world of children, they fall farther and farther behind. That's very well documented, yeah. okay? And you want them to respect adults. Why? Well, firstly, because they're going to become an adult. So they should obviously respect adults because they're gonna spend two thirds, three quarters of their life as an adult. So that better be worthwhile. So it better be respectable. Mm -hmm. Otherwise you devalue their future and that's pretty counterproductive and mean. And then the second thing is, if they respect adults and can listen to them, then adults who kind of naturally like children are more likely to teach them things and give them opportunities. And so that's a good deal. And so if your child is doing something that makes you dislike them, assuming you're in a relationship and you've ironed out most of your idiocy, then other people will also dislike that. And so if you allow or encourage your child to continue in such behavior, you turn them into someone who's miserable and socially isolated. Now, if you don't want them to leave home ever, that's probably a good strategy. If you cripple them badly enough, they won't be able to drag themselves out of your door. But if you love your child and you want them to thrive, then you do everything you can to have the world open up its arms to them. And that's a huge part of that is discipline, careful, minimal force discipline. Fewest number of rules. Mm -hmm. Few minimal, rules, few rules. Minimal enforcement. That's right. Just the least you have to do. That's right. That's exactly right. Minimal rules, because it gets too complicated otherwise, enforced with minimal necessary force. Those are excellent principles. See, part of what got me on that statement is the possibility that if you are unsuccessful, you will hate your children. 
Mm -hmm. And we see times when parents are ruining their children. And vice fall, versa. And vice versa. <laughs> yeah. Because they've fallen out of love with them. Yes. I see this at the end of life quite a bit when oh, yes. the father's dying and all the strange children are coming back into the picture and you see horrible fights oh, at that ab level. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Well, I, I can tell you a quick story. So when my mother-in-law died, she had prefrontal dementia and it started quite young. So she died when I believe she was just in her early 70s. And so it was a kind of a brutal death. And her husband really went beyond, above and beyond the call of duty with her. I mean, he just, he just made my jaw drop, man. Because as she deteriorated, he stepped in and allowed her to preserve her autonomy too. Like he wasn't over caring, he was really attentive. And when someone offered help, he would take it. He wasn't so proud, you know, in, in the arrogant way. He would take help. And, and so, and he kept her at home until he was getting old too. He couldn't get her off the chair anymore. And so then she went into the old age home where she eventually died. And her whole family gathered around her deathbed. We were there for about the last week. And, you know, that's pretty rough. She was dying of hunger and thirst, really, but the disease. And one of her daughters, a palliative care nurse, was making sure that her mouth was wet and taking care of her. And, and they all pulled together. They all pulled together. It was really something to watch. And so, and then she died. And so what happened? Well, that was awful, but it wasn't hell. Hell would have been her dying and everyone around fighting and everyone walking away embittered and full of enmity as a consequence of her life and death. But what happened instead was that all her kids had a newfound respect for their father, which has prevailed over the intervening 10 years. And all the siblings got tighter. And so they lost their mother, which was no trivial thing. But because they handled it so well, they, they gained something. That, and I'm not going to say in some naive way that it was equivalent to the loss or that they came out better. You know, you don't have to make that case. They certainly didn't come out worse. And so these, these end of life scenes, the ones you're describing, it's like those things can, bad can get so horrible if it's contaminated by enmity and deceit and misbehavior. And it, that's the difference between tragedy and hell. Since I'm a doctor, let me ask you one medical question. I know that your diet has become an issue of interest. Mm -hmm. You obviously rail thin. Mm -hmm. People could take the Jordan Peterson diet probably and mm -hmm. maybe, maybe they'll look like you, but I know that some medical issues forced you to be careful about your diet. Yes. So what specifically do you eat, do you not eat, and how has it benefited you? Well, it's mostly been of benefit to my daughter who had a very complex autoimmune disease with about 30 extremely se severe symptoms. And she learned over about a three year period of exper experimentation, what she could eat, which was virtually nothing, and what she couldn't eat, which was virtually everything. All she eats is beef and water. Beef and, and water. That's it, and she's been eating that, only that for a year, and she never cheats, because cheating has very severe consequences for her. Mm -hmm. And so, her mother has some of the autoimmune symptoms, and I have some of them, and so it looks like she got all of them. And so when, when this worked for her, and we watched very carefully over a number of years while she was doing this, and like the, the improvement in her is, I just can't believe it every time I see it. I, I literally can't believe it. It's, it. It doesn't compute. And I can't believe that it was diet either, you know, because that went against many, many things that I believed. But I decided to try her more restricted diet. And first of all, it was just meat and greens. And then I stopped eating greens too about five months ago. And her mother has been doing the same thing for about eight months. And the, re the consequences have been, they're hard to believe. I don't even really like to talk about them because I'm not a dietary expert. And it sounds so completely insane. But, but I lost 52 pounds in seven months. 52 pounds? Yeah. And I wasn't, I wasn't, I oh wasn't overweight, well I was, but not by modern standards, no. And you know, a year before that I had cut all the sugar out of my diet, eh? But I was still eating carbohydrates of all sorts. And I lost like three pounds, nothing. And then I tried this diet, it was like the first, here's what happened, this is what happened. In the first week I tried this diet, this was just meat and, and greens essentially. I quit snoring. That was way before any weight loss. It's just like it just off. 
And I was snoring a lot. It was disrupting my wife's sleep. So I thought, oh, that's really interesting. I quit snoring. Isn't that weird? And then I lost seven pounds the first month. I thought, hmm, that's quite a lot. Then I stopped having to have a nap in the afternoon because I was napping a lot. Then my gastric reflux disorder went away. Then I lost another seven pounds. Then the psoriasis that I had on my foot and my scalp, that started to go away. So, and then over the course of seven months, I stopped taking antidepressants because I didn't need them anymore. And my mood isn't perfectly regulated, but it's, it's pretty damn good. And, and I lost 50 pounds in total. And I wake up in the morning and I've never woken up well in the morning in my entire life. So, so I don't know what to make of that. I, I can't, first, and I wouldn't recommend it. Well, I'm this is not something you do it. likely. No, because, I mean, lightly. I, obviously, there were issues that were going on in your gut, but it does make me yes. curious as a physician. As you point out, I, you learn from the extremes as well. Well, here's a hypothesis. You can make of it what you will. This is a hypothesis I've formulated over the last year. And like I said, this came as an absolute shock to me, and it still is a shock. Um, and I wouldn't recommend it because it's hell on your social life. And it really makes traveling difficult. So it's, it's not to be done lightly. And there are other consequences too. But here's a hypothesis. Let's say you have a patient who has multiple complex medical symptoms mm -hmm. of unspecified etiology. Okay, so what might you do? How about if you reduce their complexity? How about if you regard every single thing they eat as a variable? Because maybe it is. So then you take them down, well, people use elimination diets, but that's... You got it down to one thing, basically. One thing. And what's weird is it appears that you can live on that one thing. So the people say, well, you can't live on an all-meat diet. It's like, mm, that's not so obvious. It defies the conventional wisdom. Yeah. Right? Well, here's the other thing that's worth thinking about, maybe. There are a lot of people who are overweight. Mm -hmm. There are way more people who are overweight than there should be. And we don't know why. Like I've read some literature that suggests that maybe it's a secondary consequence of emulsifiers disrupting our, our gut lining. There's lots of theories. But to your point, if you simplify the variables, you well, only have one. Well, the other, the other issue is what's the harm? So you eat nothing but beef for two months. Who cares? It doesn't work. Quit doing it. But maybe, like if you see symptom reduction, and I've heard stories, and these are What's, what do they say? The plural of anecdote is not data. That's right. It's like, yeah, but the plural of anecdote might be hypothesis. I really appreciate all the well, information you shared. I've taxed you. Uh, there's lots more to discuss, but uh, it's wisdom that's worth thinking about. And well, I thanks. agree with everything you're saying, but I think a lot of folks will be stimulated to think further on things that matter. Well, thanks very much for the invitation. It was a pleasure to be here and to have the opportunity to talk with you. Jordan Peterson. Be sure to subscribe to my channel so you don't miss anything. And remember to check back often to see what's new.